Thank you. Good morning, Your Honour. I wanted to say, first of all, to thank the Royal Commission for allowing me those 20 or so minutes to attend to various matters that needed to be attended to before we commenced today. And I acknowledge the, that there are a number of people out there, not just in, the, in this public hearing room, but out there listening to these public hearing live, um, um, who have been waiting for this matter to commence this morning. Thank you, Mr Beckett. I understand that Your Honour also wanted to make a, a statement with respect to another case study. Is it yes, there is, there is one matter, thank you, Mr Beckett, that uh, I do wish to address before resuming uh, in this public hearing in case study 18. Um, and that is that I do wish to mention an important matter in relation to case study 2 in which uh, I sat as a commissioner along with the chair, Justice McClellan and Professor Milroy. Case study two inquired into the YMCA New South Wales response to the conduct of Jonathan Lord. And at page 20 in our report published in June of this year, June 2014, a table sets out the positions of YMCA New South Wales staff relevant to the case study. In particular, Kelly Anderson is identified as Children's Services Manager, Southern Region, during the time that Lord was employed at YMCA. The Royal Commission has received further information and is satisfied that the reference to Ms Anderson at page 20 of that report is incorrect. Ms Anderson was not so employed at that time. Rather, she started working in that role on the 16th of January 2012 and held no other position at the YMCA before that time. Jonathan Lord's position was terminated in November 2011. Therefore, contrary to the information set out at page 20 of the Commission's report, Kelly Anderson was not an employee of YMCA New South Wales at the time that Jonathan Lord held a position there. Thank you, Mr Beckett, and we're otherwise uh, ready to resume case study 18. Thank you, Your Honour. Um, I call Christian Joseph Peterson. Peterson, do you wish to take the oath or the affirmation? Both. Would you raise the Bible in your right hand, please, and repeat after me? I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. In this royal commission. In this royal commission. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you, Pastor. If you replace the Bible and take a seat. Pastor, do you still um, do you still have credentials with the Assemblies of God? I do have credentials with the Assemblies of God. Right. Um, Pastor, I wonder if you could state your full name for the Royal Commission. Christian Joseph Peterson. Thank you. And you've provided your uh, your address to the Royal Commission. Yes. And um, you've also provided a statement dated the 3rd of October 2014 to the Royal Commission. Yes. And um, is that statement true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes, it is. I would like to make an adjustment, maybe two or three, or clarification, two or three points. Thank you. Please, uh, uh, it'll come up on the screen shortly. Which parts did you wish to change? Uh, item four, I think, is needing a clarification on date. It's two. I put two thousand six. Uh, it uh, is two, obviously two thousand seven. Yes, and uh, any other uh, amendments to your statement? Item 22, I've answered it very generally, uh, uh, 
and it should it should uh, be, be clarified that I rank the district superintendent Ashley Good, not the, the general statement. I think that says uh, that it was, I believe that it was uh, the district branch was informed. Yes, I might just get you if you could redirect those microphones a little closer to you. Or... <coughs> Thank you. Um, and so uh, I uh, notified the district branch personally. I rang, I made a phone call. Not and you spoke to Pastor Good? To Ashley, Ashley Good, who is the district superintendent. And that's G-O-O-D-E, isn't it? Yes, yes G -O -O -D -E. Are there any other changes you wish to make to uh, your statement? Item 24 uh, is, not, it is not accurate, it wasn't intentional, but I... I had open heart surgery and I was recovering in the in the February of 2013 when a communication came through that did include some of the details concerning the settlement of the case. I think in item 24, I said I have no, I wasn't involved, which is true, I wasn't involved and I had no knowledge of the details. Well, I didn't have knowledge, but in reviewing things with my uh, solicitor, uh, I discovered that there was an item had been sent to me, but I was in recovery from heart surgery during those two, three, four months. So I when you say item, was that advice from um, the lawyers or from no, the I insurer? No, I stumbled. I was looking for I was looking for as much information as I could in in the history of my uh, emails, and I, I came across that information. So I, I didn't know I had it, but I did. So that, in a sense, was an, uh, an accurate statement. But or it was not intentional. I didn't know I had the information. And right. I, did, but, I, I tend but to... Now I do. I read, I read it, so I'm now just making that correction. Thank you. I tend to the statement. 18.0032. Right. So Pastor Peterson, um, I... Am I understand that uh, you took over as the pastor of the Sunshine Coast Church in um, <clears throat> in December or January of January 2006. 2006. Right. And was there a period of crossover between you and uh, Pastor Lehman? About six months. Yes. Um, so you probably noticed yesterday that we're referring to that church by the term Sunshine Coast Church. Do you understand that? Yes. Um, and the reason for doing that is so as not to identify ALA in these proceedings. And also, the victim of the abuse is being described as ALA, and similarly, his parents also have pseudonyms. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. And there is a list of pseudonyms in front of you um, in case you need to refer to it. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'll just have those microphones adjusted because I'm, you're coming across quite softly. Thank you. Uh, so you commenced in uh, January of 2006, and how long were you the pastor at the Sunshine Coast Church for, please? Till uh, December 2012. All right. Um, <coughs> During that period of um, six years at the Sun Sunshine Coast Church, um, did you adopt specific policies with respect to child abuse that applied to the church? Yes, I think there is a document that's been submitted that had been in preparation prior to my taking the responsibility. All right. Well, let me show you. Let me show you a document. It's exhibit. Uh, 18 dash 28. Ah, sorry, it's 18 18-18. Yes, thank you. I'll have a hard copy shown to you. Is it 18 or 28? I thought it was 28, in fact, but I did say 18. I'll just have the exhibit list checked. <coughs> It's 28. Thank you, Your Honour. Is perfectly correct. That document could be shown to the witness, please. I think I think her uh, and Commissioner Atkinson we already do. have copies. We do. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you. So you'll see that's a, a document entitled Child Abuse. Mm -hmm. And I understand that this was in fact... This was a part of something called the um, a manual and policy which related to children. That's correct. And this was a part of that manual. Um, and that um, if I just go to the contents page of the entire manual, it includes philosophy, values, rosters, leader profile and description, daily procedures and formats, discipline policy, forms, child abuse and other information. Yes. Is that correct? It is correct. And that, that was in preparation prior to my coming, but when I did take the pastorate, it was brought to fruition and was adopted for that calendar year. All right. Now, the document I've just shown you, Exhibit 18-28, mm. um, was just is just the child abuse portion just of that policy. Is that right? So that's the portion I wish to ask you about. Mm -hmm. When you say, when you took over in January of 2006, who was preparing that document? It was uh, two ladies, uh, a Mrs Hatton and a Amanda Lou were the two people that were in pre preparing that documentation. Or right. had been. And, and were, they, uh, were they staff at uh, no, the church? They were not staff. They were voluntary leaders of that, uh, that uh, children's ministry. All right. And are you aware of whether they based this particular manual upon... Um, some other materials? Yes. It, obviously, it was, there was documents being circulated. I think Kids Are Us was a, a children's ministry, which is a, a cut and paste fairly completely out of their of the child abuse uh, document. And it was part of an overall training manual <clears throat> for our, all of our children's workers. Was that... Uh... Um, was that material that was provided by the State Executive of the, of the Assemblies of God? I think Kids R Us was a branch ministry somewhere within the, within the Assemblies of God uh, movement. So that's I wasn't responsible for that. That was, that was being prepared. You don't have a copy of that particular document, do you? I, I don't. I only have the cut and paste that's here in... All right. Now, um, we've received some information of a document called Kids R Us from Victoria which is, includes a number of child protection policies. Do you think it's, that it, is possibly the uh, it, document? It, it, that probably is the source. And it, what I understood, it was an, a, an evolving document in the sense that there was changes being made. All right. Uh, but it, this was, it, this was uh, put together and, and used in my tenure there yes. as the training document for our children's workers. All right. Now, this document here, the uh, Exhibit 18-28, was that, um, uh, uh, sorry, I withdraw that. I, I should ask you this first. Those two um, people, those two women who assisted with the preparation of this particular document, were they qualified in any particular way with one respect to a, uh, child protection matters? No, probably not. Uh, the one was a school teacher in training, or might just have, just have finished a training as, as a school teacher, and another one was... Um, Worked really in, 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 in a mother of, child, uh, of yes. four or five children, and in that sense had the competencies, but perhaps not the professional background. But I, I think they were very thorough in the preparation of that document. All right, and um, was this document provided, um, to your knowledge, um, to the state executive of the Assemblies of God for their input into it? No, it wouldn't have been. Yeah. And. Um, do I take it that um, the, the draft was prepared and get a copy given to you for your approval? It, it was, but it, I, I don't know whether it was formally uh, tabled in our, in our executive management. It would have been looked at at the pastoral leadership level and that there was two tiers of, 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 of operation. One is a business administration and one is a pastoral administration. So the pastoral team would have looked at that. And was the document um, approved at the board level of the church? That I can't. That I can't uh, vouch for. And 
Is this the document that applied throughout your tenure as the pastor at um, the Sunshine Coast Church? Yes. Although it may have had some in some areas, not just the child abuse, but in the in the overall, there might have been some modifications as program shifted or as we got uh, a, you know, a better focus on some areas. Now we've been provided with a document that where the cover, at least to this part of the the children's manual, says it was created on the nineteenth of January two thousand and six. Are you aware of any changes that were made between 2006 and 2012 to this part of the manual? No, I, I, I don't have any record of that. All right. So there's... I think that was seen to be adequate as best we understood. All right. Um, now, during those six-year period, was there ever an occasion where uh, the, the national or the state members of the Assemblies of God later the Australian Christian Churches came and reviewed this particular manual of yours? No. Um, probably heard some evidence yesterday from Pastor Lehman about um, attending state and national conferences but not being aware of any particular child protection policies that he, was, that he had attended. Do you recall that evidence yesterday? I do. Yes. What was the nature of... Um, induction and training with respect to this particular policy at uh, the Sunshine Coast Church while you were there? I th it would have been handled by those, those people who were running the children's department. So it, it would be part of the whole training uh, syllabus, really. All right. And what was that, what was that syllabus during the... In just in general form, during the six years that you were at um, the helm? Are you talking about implementation of that process? Well, let's go through it. Um, induction of new people coming into uh, Sunshine Coast Church who were working with children. What induction process was there for those people? That, that manual would have been the, the, the baseline of, of that induction process. I wasn't in the children's ministry but we had competent people that were. All right. Now, um, and was there training, some sort of rejuvenation of training about child protection issues at um, Sunshine Coast we, Church while you were there? We intermittently met with all the departmental leaders and, and, and then specifically children's ministry, youth ministries, yes. etc. And so there would be a review of processes that were there and things that were successful, things that needed to be adapted or, or improved or constantly reviewing things. All right. But uh, I think we can see from, from this particular policy that it was not changed or adapted um, during, the, during the time that you were there. Is that right? I, I didn't oversee any particular major changes, to my knowledge. There may have, there may have been some, because that, that document is dated on the 19th of the first month. I haven't got any other documents. I don't have access to any other documentation. All right. Now, do you recall knowing of any external training um, of members of your church that were working in children's or youth ministry from the Assemblies of God or indeed from anybody else about child protection issues? The answer is no, not specifically. There were things that were available, and I'm not sure exactly. How did you know that they were available? I think as a minister, you get information coming through on a intermittent basis of what is available. Youth support programs, children support programs. Um, but I'm, I, I would be just very general about that. I don't, I don't have any specifics. Pastor Peterson, I, I don't mean to um, be... I'm critical of you at all, but it, it seems that that process was reasonably casual in the sense that you could engage in those programs or not engage in them. There didn't seem to be um, any particular imperative to actually go through those processes. I, I, I think really what I'm saying is we had competent people that were accountable and we met weekly uh, as a pastoral team. If there were concerns, they were brought up and any things that needed to be changed were. So it wasn't meant to be a notion. It, was, it wasn't intense in terms of 
because of the competencies that were there were respected. All right, so just going to this document, that is um, Exhibit 18-28, if page 13 of that document, that's Ringtail 10, if that could come up. <coughs> and uh, if we just scroll down so you can see the conduct policy. Yes. And if you just uh, read through that to yourself. You'll see there's a, a preamble there um, about the general philosophy behind the policy. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So you'll need to say yes or no. Yes. And then there are dot points that describe certain prohibited conduct. Yes. Do you see that? Yes. And um, you'd agree that this is the, the primary part of the manual which describes conduct which those in children or youth ministry should not engage in with children? Yes. Yes. Right. So just that first paragraph where it says, the Bible says to avoid the appearance of evil, the enemy will try to destroy your ministry to the Lord, and so it is with this in mind that this policy has been formed. It shuts down opportunity for anybody to falsely accuse you. Satan is the accuser of the brethren, and there's a reference there to the Bible, and then leave no door open for him. Do you see that? I do. Why is, can you assist us by saying, why is the emphasis on the appearance of evil as opposed to evil itself? Uh, I don't think, I don't think they had viewed the document perhaps with that critical analysis on I do, I do observe what you're saying. Uh, I mean, evil is what we're really uh, wanting to avoid, not just the appearance, but the evil itself. Yeah, so you're saying that the, 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 the way in which the policy should have operated was that it should have prohibited the evil, namely the child abuse, yeah. not just the appearance of evil. Yeah, I think well, the, the, the thinking behind is one leads to, you know, leaves the door open for, for, for further, but it doesn't, doesn't state that there. All right. One sceptical eye who read that paragraph might say, well, it's, it's not evil that's prohibited, but it's the appearance of evil. don't get caught. Don't, yeah, yeah, in I other understand. words, don't get caught. Is that... Yeah, I, I, hear, I see. But that's not the... I mean, obviously, the intent is, is genuine. Uh, the legal analysis may not have been very insightful. And you realise... Uh, sorry, you, you would um, no doubt accept then that any sort of indication that um, avoiding the appearance and, and not prohibiting the evil was an inappropriate way in which to express this policy. Yes, could have been written much better. Then, um, if we go over to page 16, Appears that the uh, concerns about child sexual abuse, suspicions, rumours, and so forth are dealt with under something called suspected unusual behaviour. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And then there's a, a procedure if we go over to the next page, a series of boxes yes. which indicate a process. Is that right? Yes. Um, and then the process appears to be that the once the behaviour is observed, and that includes any concerns or suspicions about child sexual abuse, is that correct? That would include that, yes, I think. 
they submit an unusual behaviour form to the children's ministry director. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, just a, a side point on that. The, the ministry director is not a paid position within the no, church, no. or wasn't while you were there, was it? Is that correct? That's correct. Um, and then it's passed on to you as the senior minister within the church? Yes, it would, it would be. Um, and then I think the, the, the position is that the member is removed from active service in the team. Is that right? Yes. And that seems to be the end of the process. The senior pastor is informed and the, the children's ministry director and appropriate leaders observe the position. Do you see that? Yes. Now, you're aware, are you not, of um, the the uh, the policies within the Assemblies of God at the state level of uh, mand what's called mandatory reporting? Yes. And you understand that um, the state policy, certainly in 2008 and through to 2013, require... <coughs> um, that first of all, any allegations of child sexual abuse be reported first of all to child protection services in in Queensland. Do you understand that? Yes, I do. And also be reported promptly to the police. Yes. Do, you, do you understand that? I do understand that. Um, and do you accept that this policy does not include any reference to either of those processes? I do note that now. Yeah. And do you? Do you accept that that's a failing of this particular policy? It's a failing of the policy, but the procedure would have been pursued had there been a, a, a case brought to my attention. All right. Well, let's let's go back to that issue. You're saying that there was an unwritten policy within the church from 2006 to 2012, which required those receiving. Um, information about child sexual abuse to report to child protection and report to police. Is that right? Could you state that again? Please? Yeah, sorry, that was, a, that was a long way. But in any event, you're saying there was an unwritten policy about reporting of child sexual abuse, was there? I, I, th I think there is, a, there is a position that you have in the community, and particularly as a minister, that if there was a case of that nature, you would immediately go down those lines. It's, it's, I separate things from pastoral matters and police matters, and as far as I'm concerned, that would be a, 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 a matter that's not in our precinct primarily. It's, it's a legal matter. It goes elsewhere. So what you're saying is that even though there wasn't a written policy yet, the Sunshine Coast Church, in those years where you were the senior pastor, mm -hmm. if an allegation of child sexual mm -hmm. abuse had come to you, you would have reported it to the police. Absolutely. All right. Um, now, did, was that policy, that unwritten policy, communicated to, for example, the director of the children's ministry? Not in as many words, no. And you agree that that reporting part of any process of child protection is um, a vital part of that process? Yes. Yes and that um, by not instructing your, the head of the children's ministry at um, the Sunshine Coast Church, that was a, a failing? I do, but this policy comes as far as the senior pastor's desk. It, it, it didn't proceed on beyond that, the final year on uh, my duties. Yes, yeah, so that's that's the point I'm trying to make. That there doesn't seem to have been any certain written policy that goes beyond the matter arriving on your desk. Is that correct? It doesn't say that there, but that that would be uh, understanding. That would be my responsibility. All right. Now, Pastor, um, I want to now take you to the issues that surround um, ALA, and I understand that. process is that I think ALA had left your church by um, 2006 and in 2007 was worshipping at another church. 
uh, but his parents were remained part of your congregation at Sunshine yes. Coast Church. And that you received information from um, his parents that ALA's abuse had been reported to the local police? The local pastor and the police. Yes, yeah, so he had, that is, ALA had reported the matter to his local pastor and then the matter had been taken to um, ALA's parents. Is that what you understood? Basically the sequence, yeah. And that the parents and uh, perhaps the, the, the local pastor, not you, had taken the matter to the police? Absolutely. Is that right? Um, what was the what was the assistance you provided to um, ALA and his family at about that time, at the time of the charging of um, Mr. Baldwin? My my role, because neither the perpetrator uh, neither the, the, the person that was damaged were were in my sphere of influence directly. I only had one other line of support that I could give, and that was to the parents, which I gave, and I gave uh, on an open day-to-day, night-to-night basis, as needed, through the critical time. Now, um, and that was in terms of pastoral and pastoral support, is it? Yes, yeah, prayer and pastoral Spe support, spiritual yes. support. All right. Practical support where needed. Did you um, offer them any counselling um, during that that first period? That I is... am. My, my major is not counselling, but I, I had access to that and I was prepared to resource that financially if necessary, if they, as required. Did you, offer, did you offer it to them? Yes, I think it's noted. In the... Did they take it up? No. Um, but I continued to give pastoral support and counsel in that general sense. All right. Now... Uh, in terms of the way the, uh, the chronology goes in this particular matter, we know that Mr Baldwin was charged, and I'll just make sure I have the date accurately, on or about the 24th of May 2007. So do I take it that uh, you first heard... Um, about the charges being laid against Mr Baldwin at about that date? At about that date, I don't know the specific date. Now, you say that, um, at paragraph 22 of your statement, that uh, the board notified the district branch of the ACC about ALA's complaint, and I think you've, you've made some changes to say that you actually rang I Pastor rang Good. Pastor Good, yes. All right. Now, the evidence that we've been able to obtain from uh, Pastor Svensson is that that uh, information was conveyed to the State Executive about the 13th of November 2007. <coughs> so do you, do you accept that the, that the charges were reported to um, the State Executive at about that time, November of 2007? Uh, my understanding of procedures, which I understand in the light of some changes, that it now is a direct reporting to the state president. At that time, because of the three tiers of governance, it would normally be understood that any concerns were related through the district superintendent, his executive, onto the state superintendent, their executive, and if it was a matter that was of national significance, it went through to the national executive. Indeed. What I want uh, you to focus on, if you could, is the date. It, no, it, it appears that certainly Mrs. Fen Pastor Svensson is saying that he was informed by Pastor Good on the 13th of November 2007 about the charges. I couldn't, I couldn't give you any information about how long it took from to get from my phone call, which would have been within the first week. Indeed, indeed. The, the part I wanted to ask you about is that if he was charged and you knew in May of 2007, yes. 
why did it take until November of 2007 for um, that matter to be communicated to the ACC? I would have contacted in the first week of my knowing to the, to the, to the district what prolonged communication from that point on I have no knowledge of. All right. Well, I might, I might leave Mr Chowdhury to follow that, up that particular issue. But you're saying that you, you reported the issue yes. promptly to the ACC. Oh, yes. I, I did serve in the executive leadership for 20 years, so I understood policies and procedures. All right. And you understood that um, there was indeed an obligation on Mr Baldwin to report under the Code of Conduct the fact that he'd been in, accused of some form of child sexual abuse. He wouldn't, he wouldn't have... He wouldn't have uh, taken that responsibility. Uh, I understand I wasn't the pastor of Mr Baldwin at any time. So I, 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 I somehow just get caught up in the demands, but I wasn't, the, I wasn't his pastor. Uh, I was pastoring the family that was disaffected. So. Are you saying, I mean, the, the, an important issue for the Royal Commission is the way in which the Assemblies of God considers it responsible for some things yes. and not for others. Are you saying that because um, Mr Baldwin had moved, had left your particular church, that you considered that you had no responsibility with respect to no, I, him? I don't. I didn't say that as, as much. What I'm saying is I don't think automatically I had responsibility. I took responsibility and I did contact the district, as I thought was the protocol, which has now been changed to direct contact with the president. Yes. Do you think there's benefit in having some... An obligation part placed upon ACC pastors that if they become aware of um, criminal charges, for example, against a pastor, that they report that fact to the state executive. It was in the media, and every minister on the coast, which was probably 30 or 40 ministers, would be as informed as I was informed. Yes. Uh, so I would have thought it was rather open information, and I don't understand how the state... When you, say, when you say it was reported, was it reported in May or later in that year in 2007? In the media? Yes. It was in the media, I think, from pretty well the first week. Obviously name withheld of the person offended, but uh, I'm fairly certain it was in the media from the beginning. So, Pastor, are you able to assist us as to why there was a period of time of over six months between charging and when uh, Mr Baldwin's credential was suspended um, in December of 2007? I couldn't answer that question. That's in somebody else's jurisdiction, but the information would have been there. Yes, and I'm just why wondering if, it... if, you, if, you, if you have any information that you can assist us with about why there was that apparent delay. I'm not a, I can't help you there. Sorry. Right. Now, you were with the parents, I presume, for that. I want to talk to you, first of all, about the, the period between the charging up until the trial. Do you understand that period that I'm talking to you about? Yeah, so, charging in May of 2007 through to 2000, conviction 2009. in March of 2009. Do you understand that? Do you, sorry, you'll have to say yes. Yes. And during that period, do I, do I understand that you continued to provide pastoral support to... As required and as yes. requested, yes. Right. Now, did you hear ALD's evidence yesterday okay. about, about the atmosphere, if you like, within the congregation at, Coast, at Sunshine Coast Church? Yes. And um, you recall he said yesterday that there were some people within the congregation who supported him. You recall that? I do recall that. And there are also other people within the congregation who were opposed to them because they had they considered perhaps that um, Mr Baldwin had been wrongly accused. <coughs> I heard that said. Yes. Did you, during that period between charge and conviction... Were you aware of the similar dynamics within your congregation about that? I don't. I didn't see it as opposing. I saw as people in a state of conflict between the young men they had seen as a leader, and oftentimes influencing their children, and what was in the courts 
and I, as I understand it, the man presumed innocent until proven guilty. So there was a time of suspense in some people. Did you appreciate that there were particular pressures placed on ALA's parents by being members of the congregation, given that um, turmoil within the congregation? There was, there was pressure on them, but there was, amongst those that were very affirming and supportive, uh, a positive contribution going on there. Now, what steps did you take as senior pastor of the uh, Sunshine Coast Church to help to alleviate that tension, particularly the pressure mm -hmm. placed upon yeah. uh, the parents of ALA? I, uh, where, where I could and when it was one-on-one -on -one or in that type of setting where there was questions, people saying, is this possible, is this true? You know, you, the answer is we don't know for sure. But I, we, we offered and encouraged people to give support uh, to ALA's family as much as was possible. Did, um, did you explain the process, um, the, certainly the criminal process, but also the process of credentialing um, within the AOG, later the Australian Christian Churches, about how such matters are dealt with? Sorry, do you understand my question? Go again. Go I think again. I've, I'll... I'll withdraw the question and rephrase it. Thank you. Um, there was a there is a process system there within the uh, within the assemblies of God, set out in the administration manual, yes. whereby if there are allegations of this sort, that the that the pastor concerned has their credential suspended, yes. and that it awaits the uh, the criminal justice process. Is that correct? Yes. And that um, um, if if the uh, accused pastor is convicted, that then um, the credential is permanently withdrawn mm -hmm. and that the person cannot be restored to ministry at some future stage. I understand the process. Yes, and you understood the process in, yes. in 2007, yes. 2008. Um, did you explain that process to the congregation? No. Did somebody from the Assemblies of God or the Australian Christian Churches come and explain that to your congregation? I don't think I had any contact with the Assemblies God from the head office back to me in all of the procedures. So, no. And do you think that's... Uh, are you critical of um, the State Office for not having that contact? I hesitate to use the word critical, but I do think we could improve that process. Yes. And it would have, do you think it would have assisted you and you, the parents, and also your congregation if the procedures that... Um, are uh, undertaken by the Assemblies of God in such matters had been explained in some detail to um, each of those parties? In hindsight, I think we probably could have done a number of things better at a congregation level, but the name, there was name suppression, there was all sorts of other things going on, and uh, in my perceived wisdom at the time, I, I handled things just privately and individually. All right. Now, after he was convicted, that is, after Mr Baldwin was, was convicted and sentenced in March of 2009, was there any approach from the Assemblies of God to you or, to your knowledge, to the parents? Not to my knowledge. Right. Did um, you, you became aware, I presume, in March of 2009 that he had been convicted and sentenced? Yes. And um, did you advise the state executive of that fact? No, I wouldn't have. Um, was there any particular reason why you didn't do that? I felt it would be an executive matter more so than my local church. I had a pastoral obligation to the parents alone, as best I understood. At that stage, it was beyond my uh, direct... Uh, all right, so you, because the state executive had been informed through that process of speaking to Pastor Good, um, you consider that the matter was then being handled by the state executive and effectively... That would be my, my understanding, yes. Was that your understanding back in 2009? It would have been, yes. So you considered there was no need for you to actually inform them of what was going Not on? Not at all. Yes. All right. Did they write to you at any stage and ask you to um, provide them with um, updates on, on what was happening with not the criminal my, case? Not to my recollection. 
Um, did they write to you to say, can you please um, up, keep us informed of how the family, and particularly ALA, are handling matters? Not to my recollection. Um, did they write to you to say, um, can you inform the, the family, including ALA, of the, the procedures under um, the administration manual for credential holders? Not that I can recall. Um, did they write to you suggesting that um, ALA and his family be provided with counselling? Not to my, not to my knowledge. Uh, so the next step appears to be a, an email was sent by the father, and I'll have um, his email of the 7th of May 2009 brought up on screen. Tender bundle 10. And um, you're aware of, of this email that was um, addressed to um, the emails taken out, but um, you accept that this, this was sent to you on that on the date set out there, May the seventh, two thousand and nine. You've read that now? Yeah, I've, sc I've scanned it through pretty well. I think. All right, so this is an email that you received on, mm. on or about the 7th of mm. May 2009? Mm. Mm. Sorry, is that a yes or a no? Yes, sorry. Thank you. Uh, we just need it for the transcript. I'm sure you understand. Yes, I understand. Um, and you'll see it about a third of the way down. Um, ALD has written to you saying that um, Mr Baldwin has now been convicted um, clearly saying that he was expecting some form of response from the Assemblies of God. You understood that at the time? I did understand it, and I did make contact uh, with the family, obviously, in the light of this kind of communication. All right. Uh, now, the, this doesn't seem to be... The criticism doesn't seem to be directed at you, but it is directed at the Assemblies of God uh, as, a, as an overarching organisation, which included your church, didn't it? Sorry, I'll need a yes or a no. Yes. And it says that one component of the process you may be able to assist with is the deafening silence from the Assemblies of God. Yeah. Do you see that? Yes. And then he goes on to say, I see this as a significant lack of duty of care from leadership, both here at the time as well as those who supported them. And then about two-thirds of the way down, he poses the question, have AOG any processes in place to address these matters or do they just duck for cover and hope it will go away? Do you see that? I do, yeah. And then more, a bit further down, more than a month has passed since the sentencing and not a word has been heard from AOG. Do you see that? Yes. And um, you agree that that was the position, that no communication had been received by you at least <laughs> after, after that? And then if we go over to Tender Bundle 11, there's an email from you um, to a number of people, including members of the board. So it's from Chris, Pre Chris Peterson to, I see Tom Liu is there, and he was a member of the board at the Sunshine Coast Church, is that yes. right? Um, and are the other members also members of the board at that time? Uh, with the exception of Sandra Liu. All right. And um, it appears that you've been in contact with somebody called Steve at the ACC. You 
you see that? Oh, well, if you please take your time to read the, yeah. read the email to yourself. Your question again on the yes. So paragraph. it appears that you had a conversation with somebody called Steve at mm. um, the ACC. Is that right? ACS, I think, more accurately. Ah, I see. So, was it Australian Christian Churches, or was it the Australian, insurer Australian, Australian Christian, Christian Services? Been, and I think it was in in connection with uh, professional counselling being provided. That was uh, that's what it was about. All right. So the the issue you took. Sorry, I'll, I'll withdraw that. Following the email that you'd received, the one I just took you to from the father, did you have a con did you contact anybody at the ACC to raise his concerns with them? I spoke with them. Uh, I spoke with them about the the issue, and my reflection on this, as I best I can under remember, is that I would have said I am representing the ACC as a minister on the ground. The formal acknowledgement obviously was, was, was omitted, but I, I, I didn't operate just in my own behalf. I was a minister of the Sims of God or the ACC, and in that capacity I had offered all this service all the way through. So I think, to, to be fair to the ACC, they, they depend upon their ministers in a local autonomous structure as distinct from a denominational structure that we then carry yes. out our responsibilities best we can. Well, let, let's go back to it. You say you, you spoke to somebody at ACC. Yes. Who did you speak to? Do you remember? Well, it says AC, AC, I, I just changed that to the ACS. Well, you see the previous, previous paragraph. Yeah. The concern was that the Australian Christian churches had, had not, not followed fine. through with them concerning this matter. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Um, are you saying that you did not um, speak to the ACC as a result of the 2009 email from the father? No. Um, and, but you spoke instead to Australian Christian Services, who are the... Um, they probably contacted me, I would expect, and I spoke to them on that. All right. Um, how would they have known to have contacted you, given that, um, given the timing? It appears to be related to the, the email some four days earlier from the father. I can't, I can't remember. All right. Um, do, you do you recall what the response from the ACC was? Um, was it along the lines of you should speak to our insurer about... No. I didn't speak matter? to the Australian Christian Churches at any time All right. in the course of the whole proceedings uh, and only one, one phone call to my knowledge. All right. Do you think it would have assisted in resolving the father's concern about lack of response from uh, the Assemblies of God or the Australian Christian Churches if you had taken that message to them in May of 2009? The answer is probably yes. It may have assisted in hindsight. And um, you're aware that... In October of 2011, the father was still concerned about lack of action from the Assemblies of God. Mm. Sorry, was that a yes? Yes, sorry. And if we just go to the email, which is at um, Tender Bundle 18, at least the second half of that. Oh, sorry, it's Tender Bundle 17. I apologise. Just ignore the, the first part, the email from Gary Svensson. If we go for down further, you'll see there's... If you could just scroll up, please. See there's an email there from the father, and that large portion that's been redacted, it contains a large number of emails of people who received who were sent that particular email. And um, you obtained a copy of, of this email yourself? I think I would have, yes. Yes. So do I take it that you were aware in October of 2011 that this issue about 
um, the AOG not responding or not seeming to, to acknowledge the conviction of one of its passers was uppermost in um, ALD's mind. Could you just, just phrase that again? Yes, I'll put it again. Did you... So do I take it that in October of 2011 you knew that um, ALA's father was still very concerned that he had received no response from the Assemblies of God? Yes. Yes. And this email entitled A Cry from a Father's Heart for His Son was obviously an impassioned cry for assistance, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And you'd been providing... Um, pastoral assistance to this man, hadn't you? I had. For about, um, I think, four years by this stage. And I understand that he, that is the father, is not critical of you at all. Do you understand that? Yes, I do understand that, yeah. But that this email was, was intensely critical of the Assemblies of God for not responding to the conviction for child sexual abuse of a pastor of the Assemblies of God. And I think we've seen from that early, the earlier part of that email that um, the matter was taken up by Mr Svensson and we'll hear from him later this morning. Uh, but are you aware of what took place as a result of this particular email, what response the family received what, Mr. from the Assemblies of God or Australian Re Christian Churches? Mr Swenson's travel to Broome, etc. Well, uh, did anything happen between... That occurred in July of 2012... But what happened in the period between October 2011 and July of 2012? No, I'm not aware of anything. Yes, those are my questions for Pastor Peterson. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Kernigan. Um, sir, my name is Aaron Kernigan, and uh, as you know, I act for Pastor Lehman. Mr Lehman, as he is now known. You were asked some questions in relation to Exhibit 18, and I wonder if that could be shown again. This is the child abuse policy. Yes. <clears throat> that document there, and I think that you uh, were of the opinion that it may have been in preparation uh, slightly before the time that you came into your responsibilities at the church in January of 2006. Is that correct? That is my belief, yeah. And uh, is your first recollection of being exposed to this document uh, on or after January of 2006? It would be the launch of our children's ministry for that year. That document would have been prepared. So that was my first year of tenure. Is that something that would have been prepared as a matter of course each year or just on that particular occasion? It, the way I understood it, whether accurate or inaccurate, the way I understood it, it was needed. It was a, a, a very comprehensive document, training document, and uh, it was a needed document. Uh, and probably it, it might have needed revision more so than replacement year to year. It would have been <coughs> reviewed constantly because we want to... Up upgrade our children's work leaders and also the program. So, so far as you can recall today, when you commenced your work, uh, your ministry as senior pastor at the church in January of 2006, there was some form of policy, albeit a draft policy, in place on the area of child abuse. I would be of that belief, uh, personally, because the other document that was submitted, the 1994 June document, uh, was also in that collection of, you know, of the loose pages. So that so has also been tendered to the Commission. You're referring to a document that was shown to uh, Mr Lehman yesterday afternoon. Yes, the 1994 yes. document on child abuse. Is that a document that you remember seeing when you took up your responsibilities in January of 2006? I'm aware of that document because I was also pastoring churches for the last 40 years with the Assemblies of God. So, so you're saying you were aware of that document before January 2006? Yes, when it was in preparation back in the 90s. Isn't it the case that during 2006 uh, the ACC were in a process of uh, releasing a new policy in relation to child protection? 
I think that I think like any organisation, it was reviewing and uh, improving its processes all the time. Do you recall receiving correspondence from the ACC in Queensland regarding a new child protection policy? Not specifically, but I'm sure there was documents coming through. Do you recall... Oh, sorry, I'll withdraw that. In January of 2006, what <coughs> function did you serve on the board of the church? I took over as chairman of the board. And any review that was to be conducted by a subcommittee from the board, would that be a review that would be conducted under your supervision? Uh, that would be using the term loosely. There would be some direction instruction given, uh, but then the, the leaders of various departments would be responsible to, to put those kind of programs together and also uh, such as the child abuse document included. And if there had been a working party set up, for example, yes. to review the matter of child protection, would that be something that you, as the chairman, would be aware of? It wouldn't. It may not have gotten to the, the, the uh, business board of the church, but it certainly would have been handled by the, the pastoral team, which was voluntary workers as well as staff pay, paid staff workers. I'll just ask you to look at Tender Bundle 1 when that comes up on the screen. Do you recognise that document? Just ask if the document can stop at that point. Have you been able to scan that information? Do you want me to speak to item four, or, you, or the, you just? No, just I just want to know if you've had a chance to review that material. This is this is sort of very uh, much in my, my first steps into the to the uh, office, so I'm. Well, you see that there is an entry there, uh, or the, the title of the document, first of all, is Minutes of Resignation of Ministers Baldwin and Lehman and ACC Child Protection Policy Implementation. Do you see that? Yes. And you agree that the first date there, relating to item five, is the 27th of June 2006. And then down the page, we come to a date prior to that, 12th of January 2006, in which item four is specified, and mm -hmm. then there is 4.1 <coughs> child protection policy changes. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. And it refers to the letter from the ACC. First of all, can you uh, indicate if you've read what's under 4.1? Do <coughs> you see that? Yes, I do. Do you remember a minute of a board meeting to that effect being made? This, this would have been the, the, the meeting I took over as the chairman. So obviously this work was done prior to my taking over, but the, the person that was given the, the task was one of the new appointees to the board. Right. And uh, by the this is on the twelfth, on the nineteenth, that document was was prepared. So there was some very rapid action, I think. Now you say the nineteenth. Are you referring to the nineteenth of December date? Nineteenth of January. Nineteenth of January date. Six, which is the child abuse document date. All right. And you say the nineteenth of January, that document was prepared. Is that what you're saying? Yes. And so the document that you referred to this present this this instruction was given uh, that final preparation of that document right was presented. now I want to be fair to you sir and take you 
down the page mm -hmm. and over the page, and you will see an entry there under the date 8th of November 2007, and a paragraph that has certain words. Do you agree that those, so that is the paragraph under 8th of November 2007, appears very similar to the paragraph I've just taken you to on the preceding page? Yes. Is it your memory that this child protection policy letter from the ACC Queensland office came in January of 2006 or November of 2007? Are I would, you unsure? I, would, I, think, I, would, I, I am not sure, but I would think there was an ongoing communication from our state office on such matters. Well, you see, what's recorded both on this page and you can accept from me on the preceding page as being on the 19th of December 2007 is... That indication there that a person named Lyndon reported that a working committee uh, had been formed. Mm -hmm. Do you remember anything about the details of that working committee? No, I don't. Do you remember anything about when it was formed? No. You accept that if that date is correct, that that working committee appears to be in some response to or related to the ACC Queensland office letter detailed in the note above. Mm -hmm. And you'd accept that that occurred well into your ministry as senior pastor? Possibly. Having seen that, and considering Exhibit 18 that you were shown before the child abuse policy, is that a policy that was developed or adopted by your church during the course of this working committee. I'll just show you on the screen again, Exhibit 18. Just to remind you of that document. Yes, yes. That's a document that I think you said you recall yeah. being in the works when you took up your responsibilities at the church. I'm saying I believe it was. Yeah. Is it possible, having looked at those file notes, that that's a document that was adopted by the church during the progress of the working committee that I've taken you to? I think, I think a lot of this stuff is, is constantly in the, in, the, in the process of being uh, reviewed and, 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 and revision done. Uh, that would be the normal process in every, in every church organisation. So are you saying that the working committee in 2007, or the end of 2007, would have naturally reviewed a document like this, if it existed at that time? I would, I would have think that would normal, that would be the procedure, but, but simply just with the mindset of, of upgrading and, and updating and, and, and refining and improving. You were asked this question by Council Assisting early in your evidence this morning, and this is at page 9857, the question at line 16. We've been provided with a document where the cover at least, and it's referring to this document on the screen, where the cover, at least, to this part of the children's manual says it was created on 19 January 2006. Are you aware of any changes that were made between 2006 and 2012 to this part of the manual? And your answer was, I don't have any recall of that. I think that was seen to be adequate, as best we understood. Having seen the notes that I've taken yeah. you to, uh, is it the case that, in fact, that manual and any other policy that may have existed at the time was under review within two years of you taking up your position as senior pastor? Yes. Yes, yes it was possible. I, I, I don't have any details. Yes, thank you, Your Honour. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr O'Brien. Thanks, Your Honour. My name is O'Brien. I represent Mr. ALA, his mother and father. Um, you were shown uh, tender bundle number 10. Uh, that was an, an email that you received from ALD. Recall being shown that by council assistant. 
We received that email on the 7th of May 2009. Can I ask you a series of questions about that document, yeah, if I may? I, obviously, it's a very detailed document. Answer the best I can. Do you want to read it again? Yes. So you remember being asked questions by council assisting in relation to that yes. particular email, and you remember when it was sent to you? Uh, you there's 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 a, a, a lot of things come. I I can't say you. I, I remember specifically uh, the time and place, but yes, I'm aware of the document. <clears throat> well, you, you received this email, and your evidence earlier was that you had a meeting with. Um, the mother and father of ALA within the days afterwards. Is that, is that right? Just could you roll that down and give us the top of the date on that just to refresh my mind? I, I was constantly in touch with the family or as, as needed throughout the whole time so it's, it's hard to say were you there or did you on a certain day. Uh, Alright, well I'll come back to that. We were accessible. Thank you. Uh, in, in any event, when you um, received this this email, it it was, I imagine, in your mind, it was it was quite a pressing matter. You just had a conviction recorded against a youth pastor in the church. Uh, he'd just been sentenced to imprisonment. And uh, in those circumstances, this would have been of some, of some moment Huge. for you. That's right? Yes, that's correct. And, and what the family were obviously conveying in this, in this um, email, amongst other things... One of the significant things that was being conveyed was the, the concern about what the leadership of the church was going to be doing, what sort of assistance they'd provide. Is that right? Yes, that's right. That, that, that was obviously the way you read the, the email, correct? Yes. And, and in addition to that, concerns were being relayed to you as someone who assisted the family as to, to what the leadership were actually going to do. That's right. Yes. And uh, you, you, you said earlier uh, in your evidence in uh, relation to those questions asked by Council Assisting that you acknowledged that you should have gone and spoke to the ACC about it directly. Yes. And you acknowledged that that may well have assisted the family. It may have, yes. 
and when you look at this email again, you've now looked yes. at it a couple of times in these proceedings, it's fairly obvious that's precisely what was being asked of you. Is that right? It, it is, yes. You obviously saw the need for support and immediate supervision and partial care, which you provided, correct? Yes. But you agree with me, you'd agree with me, wouldn't you, that a failing on your part was not going higher, not putting pressure on those above you and those responsible at the top to assist the victim of the abuse and the family of, the, uh, of that person. Yeah, I, 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 I accept uh, some responsibility there. I could have done much better. Okay. The, the, you, were so, you were talking about um, the the structure of the, um, the ACC. Can, can, can you go through that again? It was, it was you, and who's above you? Uh, above. The, the way it's structured, it's, it's, it's national, state, and then the states are broken into districts. Right. So they have a district superintendent, yes. state president, national president, right. over executives at each level. So you've got district uh, superintendent with, with his executive yes. leadership. We, and the normal accountability process and reporting process is is upline. In other words, it's, it's sometimes very difficult for one of the rank and file pastors to connect with the state president. The process is go to the district. The district looks after the pushes it through, and if the state thinks it's responsible, they take it to the national executive. In between conferences, which is our final authority. So, so it's a it was a pretty cumbersome sort of government of the organisation, isn't it? I think it does become unwieldy and it comes somewhat difficult to work with, uh, as has been reflected in other matters that have been on the floor. The, this government structure that you were working with, did it provide an impediment to your dealing with this, with the ACC in any other way? I mean, was oh, that... I I am not going to use any excuses here. I think if I had been a little bit more vigorous in my pursuit of the process, I could have made it work. But I don't think it offers an open door process and policy where you can readily get access. And I think that probably is needing a review. That, that was the case in, in uh, 2009. Was it, is that still the case in your view? Now? I, I am now retired, so I am, I am largely out of the functional side of the, the, the Ministry of the Fellowship. Obviously, as a minister or pastor of a, of a, of a, of a parish and a church, uh, you, you have a, a large number of people who have um, a special connection with you. That, that, that is obviously the case. Yes. Uh, one, of, one of those... A set of people was the the family of ALA. Yes, and uh, and amongst them there are other worshippers at the church as well who, uh, no doubt, would feel for ALA and his family going through this, and yes. and and um, and you share a connection with all of them in a pastoral sense, as this, as the senior pastor of the church. Yes. Did you feel at that stage that you had an obligation as the Minister of the Assembly to put pressure upstairs to 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 assist the family in, in, in compensating ALA? As I reflect on things now, uh, I think in, in context to what you've just said, yes, I, I could have done and I should have done more. And uh, there is no excuses for that. It just uh, maybe it was a blind spot in my. I was attending to their felt need at the time. But I was not accounting for the assemblies of God or ACC's lack of uh, involvement, and I should. Well, the family raised in this email also the concern that they had about a breach of a duty of care by your, your predecessor, your immediate predecessor. Yes. That, that, that's clearly raised there, isn't it? Yes, it is. 
and you you would have recognised as a board of that, well, a chairman of the board of the church, that a, a, a breach of that type of duty may well lead to um, not only civil action but a, a moral and legal responsibility to compensate. Correct? Yes, I think that would be understood. So, so why why didn't you then, understanding that moral and legal responsibility, why why didn't you then put pressure upwards? Was it? Well, I object to the question at the start because the state executive had no legal responsibility for compensation. That was the autonomous church, and that's been established yesterday. It's been established throughout the hearing. So I really don't see the. Uh, Relevance of the question on that basis. No, He's already been asked about that... why he didn't forward the concerns to the, uh, up the line, and he's given answers about that. But... Well, the, the, the first set of questions, <laughs> the first set of questions related, Your Honour, to the um, to, to the to the request to do so. Yes. The second set of questions related to. A personal understanding as a obviously professional, intelligent man in that position. So I understand that the, the, the um, objection, the basis of the objection from Mr. Chowdhury is the inaccuracy of the legal responsibility, not to not to the that part of the question right. that, that uh, refers to the moral responsibility. No, I'm only asking this witness with respect, Your Honour whether he recognised that there may have been a legal responsibility on behalf of the church that he was the board of, uh, board of, uh, on, uh, chairman of the board of. With respect to the board as opposed to the um, Australian Christian churches? Oh, OK. Well, I'll, I'll rephrase and come back to it. Perhaps that's an opportune time. We'll just take 15 minutes now for the mid-morning break.
Dankeschön. Uh, so, uh, prior to the break, I was asking you, um, sir, about the the email that you received from ALD on the 7th of May 2009. Uh, and in particular, the concern raised by ALD that there was a there was a failing in the leadership of the church. Now when when you heard ALD talking of that that type of language of failing in the leadership of the church, um, if, if we can have um, Ten to bundle ten on the screen, please. You, you you realize that he was talking on one level about Lehman. Did you? Just refreshing my thoughts. I can accept that. ALD had said in the email, this crime was carried out under the nose, under the noses of the leadership at the time, not yourself, despite them having been approached by concerned congregation members. You can see that? Yeah, I see that, yeah. And then further down, ALD wrote, What about our church? Can you see that? What about our church? I see what is the church's position. Um, where is it from there? So, well, okay, what is the church's position in this matter? Are the leadership concerned about the victim at all? Have they ducked, a ducked for cover, hoping this will go away? A young man actively involved in their church has been seriously wounded in all this. You see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. And then, and then further down, what about our church? Have the AOG any processes in place to address these matters? Or do they just duck for cover and hope it will go away? I see that. So... ALD was obviously talking about the leadership within the Sunshine Coast Church on one level. You'd accept that? Yes. And, and on another level, he was concerned about what the AOG was going to be doing about this as well. <clears throat> yes. Now, you spoke to ACS... I was contact. This is concerning the counselling availability. Yes. yes, that was. They contacted us on that. I think. So, so they they contacted you and you spoke to them about counselling and assistance for the family. I said that's what I'd already offered. I think if I recall. And were were you aware that the that were you aware that the um, the Sunshine Church, of which you were the senior pastor and chair of the, of the board, had the insurance arrangements in place with Ansvar? Every church within our organisation has got all those levels of insurance in place. Right, so the public indemnity insurance has been referred to. That You're aware of that insurance at the time? Absolutely, absolutely. It's a mandatory, I think. And, and you understood that any potential civil action or claim for compensation that might be made in relation to an action against the church might need to be referred to the insurance company? I think that thing, that aspect of what's being handled by my business administrator. Who was that? Mr Lou. Thank you. And you... But, but uh, you understood that there, there may well be 
a legal responsibility for the church. Uh, absolutely. And, and that is for the Sunshine Coast Church. Yes. Did it dawn upon you that there may be a legal responsibility to the AOG, that they had a legal responsibility to what had happened to ALA? Well, I'm not a lawyer, so I, I probably hadn't drilled down on those possibilities. Going back then to the email, you understood from the email that ALD was saying, you know, what's the position of the church and also what's the position of the AOG? You understood that? Yes. And you, you were, I suppose, at that stage able to comment on the position of the church, right? I guess, uh, yes. You, you provided local support and assistance to the family? Yes, I did. And you didn't, on your own admissions uh, and accepting responsibility for the failings of those, contact the AOG? Adequately. Yeah. And do you... Do you think that when Mr ALD wrote this email to you and at that time, that he had the impression that the AOG had a responsibility to what it, for what had happened to his son? It seems in the general tenor of it, he was, he was saying that my off-the-record response to him was that I was representative of the Assemblies of God so they would be depending upon me as the, the local minister of an autonomous congregation to do certain things, and maybe that's where there was cloud as to where things begin, where things don't, and, uh, where things end, and whether, whose responsibility starts and finishes where. So did you have any intention of trying to keep it local and not present it at a, at, a, at a broader level? I was aware that the broader level was well informed, both the media and general communication by this time, in the suspending of credentials, etc., etc. Uh, they would be very adequately across, across the information, whether they had the um, uh, process in place to execute any uh, things that that's beyond my knowledge. So, so at this stage, when you received this e email, you thought, "Oh, the AOG are well aware of this already." Well, I was trying to do what I needed to do, and uh, and the AOG obviously were well aware. So you thought your role was simply to keep. I was doing what I could at the very hands-on personal level uh, until that they the family moved, and of course, that was fine. Can, can we have a look at um, 10 to bundle 9, please? Um, th this is from your business administrator, yeah. um, Tom Liu. It's dated the 29th of March, 2009. <coughs> you see that? Yes. This is two days after the conviction of uh, John Baldwin. Jonathan Baldwin. Yes. Do you recall receiving this email, email two days after the conviction of Baldwin? No, I, no, I'm not aware. Of, I wasn't aware of the chronology, but I am aware of the, the, the essence of it, yes. Did you receive it? I think I would have. I, uh, it's, the, the reason it's I ask is my, I, I, the, I don't know. The what recipients the, have been redacted. I don't know if you were or you weren't. I'm asking that question I, in fairness I, to you. I couldn't answer that question. It, it, uh, it's, it's the a, sort of email that would be 
Well, it would have come. Up, it would have come out from a board direction, I think, or at least uh, in some degree of consultation. Because it's fair to say that the church that you were the chairman of the board of was concerned about a civil suit. I have an obligation as the chairman of a board to be across all the matters, including the matter that's before us. So. Yes, there is, a, there is a responsibility to look at all the facets of, and implications here. So, so you were concerned that there was going to be civil action against the church? We were prepared for whatever it, it, it was required and um, well, we were not... So this email... Well, ask the witness be allowed to finish his answer. Well, it wasn't responsive, that's why I'm asking it again. That you were aware that there was... Sorry, this email indicates, does it not, that there was concern about a civil suit, right? It says that, yes. Yeah. And so you were concerned about that suit causing financial damage to the church? I'm not sure that the, the preface to that email suggests that we were going into a multi-million dollar uh, business deal. It doesn't say the numbers there and that we needed to be wise in uh, what we committed the church to if we were in a precarious uh, legal position. So obviously that's just a, a good question, I think, for, for a responsible leadership. You were concerned that a suit causing financial damage to the church might be taken? Is that, is that the case or not? Well, if we wouldn't have gone in because we couldn't have serviced the demands of that civil suit. We were talking about a, uh, a at the second paragraph. I'm thinking, like you, that it may be best to purchase it, the new property in a separate entity. But that separate entity was already established. That there was a business, there was a property holding entity already in place. Are you struggling to accept that there was a concern on your part as the chairman of the board not, of the church? Not struggling for that, a moment. That, that there was a a, a financial uh, interest that might be adversely affected against the church by some sort of civil suit by ALA? Is that a difficult question? No, it's not a difficult question, and my answer is simply we were trying to be responsible as, as, as leaders and business managers on behalf of a congregation of people. It wouldn't be wise for us to take on another major obligation if we were about to have it to sell properties that we already own to serve as a debt that could arise out of that. And, and what this email was talking about was the, the purchase of, the, the potential purchase of new property, correct? Yes. For our, our welfare. At, in, in a new entity other than the, the church's initial entity. I don't think that that's very accurate because we already had three entities. One was a property holding non-trading company. <laughs> And the effect of this email, sir, if you accept, accept it from me, is that you were trying to avoid any sort of action impacting on the acquisition of assets of the church. This, this looks like my business manager con, uh, connecting with our uh, financial advisor as the primary recipient of that. This is the church itself are trying to minimise the financial damage that was going to happen if there was a civil suit seeking compensation for We were minim minimising nothing, sir. We were prepared to do whatever was proper. And that was in the days after the conviction of Baldwin. That just was, happens to be incidental to the reality. We were, we, were, we were going on with our life. We weren't waiting for the outcome of a court case. And in the months after, in your exchanges with the family of ALA... Yes. ..seeking redress from both the church and the AOG, you did what you could in a pastoral capacity. Yes. But you made no effort to assist the family in trying to have them compensated by the AOG, did you? The ACS, which is the insurance company, was 
obviously in the loop with my business manager. I, I, I don't know whether I heard your question correctly, but that's, I think the information is there. You, you thought it's sufficient to have the ACS provide um, whatever services they could do. That would be enough. I think they were handling it, the matter, as best as I understood. It was beyond my immediate sphere of responsibility. Functionally, I thought. That was the, it was the it was it was the A A O G was it who organised your insurance policy? No, we we negotiate with the A C S, which yes. is the business arm of the Assemblies of God, or A C C. So the A C C. Um, so you were contacted the ACC. The ACC organised the insurance policies with your... No, ACS, the Australian Christian Services, which is the business arm of the ACC. So we don't deal with the ACC on that matter. We deal with their business arm, which is the ACS. Did you at that stage see a legal responsibility by the ACC towards um, the family of ALA and ALA? Yourself. I thought that was being handled by the ACS and by the insurance company. I was out of that loop, and that was that was a separately uh, negotiated settlement. Thanks for your time, both of Thanks, Mr. Robert. Mr. Chaudhry. I assume my name is Craig Chowdhury. I act for Australian Christian Churches. Thank you. Uh, just to the change you made today to paragraph 22 of your statement, yes. perhaps if that could be brought up for your benefit, sir. I'm just asking it be brought up on the screens uh, for your benefit. Yes. Uh, when did you realise that that change should be made? I thought it was very general. When things are processed through a board, you can say we, or you can do take the personal, and it was a personal pronoun, it was myself, I did it, as it was my appropriate responsibility to do. All right. So I, I just changed, I, I adjusted that, and, or I think more accurately aligned that. Right. So you made the change today that you rang uh, Ashley Good, who is the district superintendent. I believe I did. All right. I believe it, without doubt I did. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you made reference to media uh, reports in 2007 uh, of uh, Baldwin being charged. Yes. All right. Uh, would you agree that uh, any media coverage was in the local newspaper only, the Sunshine Coast News? I do think it... I think it went electronic as well as print media. Uh, to the best of my recall, and I can't vouch for that, but I, I, it's, it's in my understanding it, it was covered at uh, at least at, certainly at electronic uh, radio media, but certainly I, I'm fairly certain the uh, news as well. Not that our men sit and watch the news. Right. So there might have been some local radio commentary. Is that what I, you're saying? I think there was some things noted uh, at that level, and certainly in the paper it was there. Of course, the uh, ALA's uh, identity was uh, suppressed. And uh, I suggest that uh, Baldwin's identity was suppressed as well. I'm not sure. It, it may have been, but the church's... It was just referred to, I think, even then as a church on the Sunshine Coast. Correct. Uh, I take it you weren't familiar with Queensland law about what could be published at that time? Pardon me? You weren't familiar with the Queensland uh, law... No, I was not. I was, I, it was breaking over all of us at the time, the, yes. the, the enormity of the s situation. Well, my proposition is you'd accepted that in 2007 all that was reported was that there was a complaint of sexual abuse arising out of a church on the Sunshine Coast and that neither the complainant's name nor the offender's name were mentioned. Do you accept that? I am not sure that that is totally accepted, uh, totally accurate. I, I think maybe uh, I, it maybe it was my, I couldn't say. All right. I, I would have thought that maybe uh, Baldwin's name was mentioned. But I'm not sure. All right. Uh, I won't have a discussion of what the law in Queensland was about that. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you 
accepted that you did not inform the state executive of Baldwin's conviction in Directly, yes. 2009. Well, did you inform the district superintendent of that? I believe so. Right. Uh, do you have a specific recollection of doing that? Yes, I, it's in my mind that discussions. I don't talk to the superintendent often, so uh, on matters that I think are important, I would, and that uh, would come into that category. I want to take you back to that email uh, from uh, ALD in March 2009. May 2009. Thank you. Which is at tab 10 of the uh, tender bundle. You've had the opportunity now through the questioning to read all of that, correct? Yes. And if we just scroll down to the bottom, there was a specific request, wasn't there? Yes. Can I leave this with you to pass up the line? And systems must surely be in place for the appropriate handling of such matters. All right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. you've, you've already conceded that you didn't do that, correct? I have. Yes. Uh, it would have been easy for you simply to forward that email onto the Ashley Good or to the State Executive, correct? Yes. Thank you. you uh, it's put to you that uh, at this time in 2007 through to 2009 that the structure of the Assemblies of God, then becoming the Australian Christian Churches, was uh, cumbersome. It was a very straightforward structure, wasn't it? The structure is there and it looks straightforward. It is sometimes more difficult to navigate that structure. By that, by that I mean uh, the accessibility of, of the office holders may not be, seeing they require us to speak to, for instance, the state president with such matters. Uh, you would, there's two or three major points of explanation in the process, which is the process if you wanted to verbally or telephone through that system, it's not, it's not uh, an open process. And I think probably is, if you're going to set that policy in place, you need an open, accessible channel to work through. And I don't think it would be that. I don't think it, most phone numbers are not that well, accessible. Well, I can't suggest that uh, the phone numbers for the state executive were readily available to you and indeed other pastors in the movement. you accept that? I hear what you're saying. Or do you accept it? I don't, I don't have access to that, but you're telling me I do. So I maybe need to get a bit more skillful in my technology. Look, weren't you on the state executive for a considerable part? 20 years. 20 years on the state executive? Yes, I was. And weren't you the uh, assistant uh, superintendent? I was. It's now called the vice president? Vice president. So you uh, well understood how the system worked, didn't you? Yes, it was, and that's where I went through the, the tears of that day, which was district, state, national. Uh, you knew the national president, didn't you, in 2007 and 2009? Mr Alcorn? Yeah, you knew him well, didn't you? I knew him very well. You knew Mr Swenson, the state president? Very well. Right. And uh, I suggest you could have easily picked up the phone and called them if you wanted to speak to them. That's what you're saying. I don't have their numbers, but that's fine. Or did you make any effort to get their numbers to speak no, to them? No, I didn't. Uh, you obviously had internet access in 2007 through yes, 2008. Yes. So presumably you had access to your computer? Yes. And uh, were you aware that there was a website for both the national movement and for the state? you could access. Are you yes. aware of that? I'm, I'm, I'm assured that there is uh, that, yeah. You're sure there is? Is yes. that what you're saying? Yeah. My question was, were you aware in 2007 and 2009 that there was a publicly available website for both the state and national executives of the movement? Yes. And... Uh, you could simply go to that and look at the contact numbers for the various executives. Do you accept that? To their office? 
Yes. Thank you. Now, uh, just pardon me for a moment. Uh, if tender bundle 14 could be brought up, please. You may not have seen this, sir. Uh, please let me know if you haven't. Uh, this is a, a report from Gary Swenson, dated the 12th of October 2011. Have you seen this before? Yes, I've cited this document. All right. If we just scroll down. And there Mr Swenson summarises uh, two conversations he had with you on the 11th and 12th of October 2011 about uh, the family of ALA, correct? Well, I'll give you an opportunity to read it and then you can answer that question. All right. Uh, do you recall those conversations with Mr Swenson? I don't, as a matter of fact. Uh, do you recall in October 2011 uh, Gary Swenson calling you to speak to you? No, I don't. Uh, do you accept uh, that he made those conversations? Sorry, I withdraw that. Do you accept that he had those conversations with him? I can accept that. I just can't remember that. All right. Fair enough. Thank you. I could take you to tender bundle one. You've been shown this before. And these are the minutes. Do you know who typed these up? No, I don't. Uh, who normally prepared the minutes for the board of the Sunshine Coast Church? The, the, you know, the agenda then take the secretary. And who's the secretary? And the, this the, there would, there would be, I think at this time there's probably somebody doing the minutes, uh, taking the minutes. Um, what was it? A, a young minister called David Dawkins. David Dawkins? Possibly. I, I would, All right. I, I accept that. It's possible. Cool. Anyway, if we go to the second page of that, if we scroll down. And uh, it refers to a letter being received from ACC Queensland in regards to the new child protection policies and implementation. You see that there? Yeah. It's the case, sorry. Yes. It's the case, isn't it, that you would uh, receive communications from the state executive on a variety of topics, correct? Absolutely. And uh, there were uh, state conferences for pastors? Yes. Would you attend those state conferences? I attended a percentage of them, yes. Yes. Uh, and you'd agree that at the state conferences you attended, sometimes policies or revision of policies would be discussed? Yeah, to some small degree, yes. I think it was part of the conference. Would you agree that pastors... In particular, you were given the opportunity to attend training in respect of policies of the yeah, movement? on a regular basis. I think that's there. On a regular basis? I, th I think it's on various, uh, various uh, and particularly administrative things, yes. All right. Thank you. If you just go to the uh, uh, 3.1 there under the 19th of December 2007, this is the establishment of working committee. Uh, Lyndon reported. Who was Lyndon? Lyndon Westbrook, who was a uh, probationary minister with the Assemblies of God. And I take it you know the other persons mentioned there? Yes. It, uh, school teachers, two, uh, three of them, I think, it, uh, out of the four are school teachers. <coughs> Thank you. Yes, I'm not a further. Mr. Taylor. 
Thank you, Your Honour. Just briefly, um, Mr Peterson, when did you retire as a pastor of the church? <clears throat> Early December, 5th of December 2012, to be precise. And you made the statement, um, it's been tendered earlier today, on the 3rd of October, that's the statement to this Royal Commission, the 3rd of October 2014? Yes. Did you have access to any documents when you made that statement? That was a telephone interview and uh, it was with no notice of items to be, uh, to be asked. I'll just ask you again. Did you have access to any documents when you were preparing no. that statement? That's a no, sir. That's a no. Thank you. Now, um, do you recall um, the email from Mr ALD dated uh, 7 May 2009 that you've been shown? It's in 10 bundle 10. You know the email I'm talking about. Um, did you respond to that? That is, respond to Mr ALD? I think I did. Uh, I did to, uh, respond. Right. Maybe right. not in detail as I... Is it, 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 it required? Your Honour, could um, tender bundle 27 be brought up on the screen, please? <coughs> if you, for the time being, just <coughs> ignore the very top part, mm. you'll see it says from. Chris Peterson, sent yeah. 11 May 2009 to ALD. Do you recognise that email? Mm -hmm. That email? <coughs> I'm certain I can. And did you send that email to Mr. I, I would have sent that email. Thank you. Now, you were asked some uh, questions by Mr. O'Brien in relation to um, <coughs> the insurance situation and the insurance claim. Uh, did you take any active role in dealing with the civil proceedings which were taken on behalf no, of. Not at all. Not that um, Mr. Swenson has prepared a report uh, dated the 4th of September 2012 in relation yes. to, to this matter. And in that report, um, he says um, that you were not in close relationship and connection with the ACCC and failed to advise the state executive of anything concerning the matter. You're aware of that document, aren't yes, you? Uh, did you have any conversation with Mr Swenson in relation to the preparation of that report? Nothing that I recall. Now, um, you were involved in the, the Sunshine Coast Church for some six years, correct? And prior to that, you'd been involved in other churches? Yes. Um, based on... And how many years were you involved in other churches? Uh, prior to that time, about nearly 40 years. Based on that experience, is there anything you think you could tell the Royal Commission uh, in relation to matters which have been aired in the hearing, which would assist the Royal Commission in making its recommendations? I mean, there's always a human error, and I certainly uh, did not pursue things for a number of reasons. From my perspective, it's somewhat difficult, but as been highlighted, I didn't perhaps try very hard. But I do think if you're going to require that we, rep we connect directly to a president of an organisation, then we've got to minimise the hurdles 
and the hoops, whereas you, you get to a, the first line of reception and then the personal assistant and then so forth, each one requiring some definition of the, the, the problem to get through ultimately to where you need to go. I think that is a, a too difficult a course to get to, the, to that. If you're going to require report direct pastor, senior pastor reporting to president, I, I, I think it's just not that simple to do. And my suggestion would be that we create some sort of hotline of facility where every senior pastor had a, 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 an immediate connection on matters of such importance, not just to uh, encumber his life, but to facilitate for a more effective reporting process. Uh, because have, I'm, not, I'm, not, not, I'm not uninformed of the proceeds for searches. I worked in the executive for 20 plus years. I think it needs to be simplified so it can be worked. Uh, more effective. That would be my suggestion. Do you have any other suggestions that the Royal Commission might wish to look at? I think uh, I've, I've said as much as I can. Thank you. <coughs> yes, nothing arising. <clears throat> Just one matter which um, in some ways follows from that, um, Pastor. Um, perhaps um, are you able to describe the atmosphere that existed inside your congregation at the time the news of the charging of Jonathan Baldwin broke? I think there was, across the congregation as a whole, uh, for those that knew Jonathan, you can understand the congregation does grow and change, uh, there was shock. There were shock and then questions, who and how many and who else? And so there was all sorts. And so it created a, 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 a period of uncertainty, I suppose, and difficulty. Uh, and it was hard to know whether you go public to try and work or you just work with the people that are primary in influences of, of atmosphere and of response. And so that's... Uh, you know, that's where that's the way I approached it, right or wrong. That's what my choice was to work at the grassroots with the people. And in the forty or so years that you'd been involved as a pastor of the church, had you had to deal with such a situation before? I know it sounds like I had a dream run, but uh, <coughs> I had not handled a situation of that nature in my pastoral responsibilities before. So, in terms of having to deal with that level of distress and shock and bewilderment um, within the congregation. Which was generated from a, a staffer? No, never had I had to deal with that. So what, um, what guidance or training or resources were available to you uh, to assist you as the pastor to deal with that situation inside the congregation? I saw no overt expressions of support in the system, but I'm sure had I drilled down and pursued, there was possibly support for me. Uh, I had a pastoral experience and I understood how to work with situations, but I, I, I didn't access. Uh, and that's a bit of a reflection of our autonomous structures. We, are, we have a commonality of coordination, but when it comes to the expression of the congregation, it's autonomous, so we're largely responsible for, for so, executing those things. <coughs> were you aware that there was, uh, in, inside the um, fellowship or under the umbrella of the Assemblies of God at that time, were you aware that there were um, resources, be they um, written or personal resources, available to you to assist you to work with the congregation at that time? You know, I was not aware of any uh, expressed, defined uh, resource available. Uh, but, I mean, if you just think through, um, obviously an organisation as big as we are, there is no doubt. You know, if, if, if you pursue it, there, it you could possibly uh, get that help. So... Did you seek that help? No, I didn't. Um, and 
why was that? Well, it was an emerging thing for a start. It was the, the first wave is, you know, and then there was a drawn out court case proceeding, I think, some two years um, until there was the proof of guilt. And so, in that, there's a suspense time. Uh, so we're just trying to manage it the best we were able, and I think largely we, did, we were able to, to, to work our way through uh, overall very positively. Albeit there's, you know, uh, people who as ALDs fam and the family did feel some difficulties there. But it's, that's it's, not their, it's not their view, is it? Their, their view was there were some people that gave great support to them and some people didn't know how to connect to them and I, I understand that because it was there wasn't the formal conclusion at the onset there was just charges <coughs> anything arising out of that no nothing for, arising. You, for you mr Chad oh, there is one matter at, yes uh, <laughs> were you aware in 2005 there was an initiative through the church in Queensland with Mr Neil Scott to provide training to pastors, in particular the area of child abuse and child protection? I was in South Australia pastoring a church at that time, so no. Thank you. Yes, nothing further. Thank you, uh, Pastor. You're all excused. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you so much. <coughs> Call Gary Swenson. Do you wish to take the oath or the affirmation? The oath, thank you. If you raise the Bible in your right hand, please, <coughs> and repeat after me, I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. The evidence I shall give. In this Royal Commission. In this Royal Commission. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. If you just replace the Bible, please, and take a seat. <coughs> Sir, I wonder if you could state your full name for the Royal Commission. Gary David Swenson. And uh, you've provided your address to the Royal Commission? That's correct. And uh, your current occupation is a, as a Minister of Religion? Correct, yes. And you've provided a statement to the Royal Commission dated the 29th of September 2014. That's right. Is it true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes, it is. I tend to that. 18.0033. Should have asked you are there any changes you wish to make to that sign? No. Uh, <clears throat> so, what is your uh, current role within um, the ACC? Uh, the title is the State Minister's Director. Yes. Um, and um, you're a Minister of Religion, so um, are you, I presume that means you're a pastor with credentials from the Assemblies of, from the Australian Christian Church? Yes, that's correct. Yes. And how long have you been a, a pastor with uh, the ACC? Since 1976. Um, and in, in 2007, what was the uh, position that you occupied at that stage? 2007, I was State Vice President. <coughs> and um, how long were you in that position for? Since October 1998. Until what year? Until 2008, October 2008. All right. And... Um, then is that when you became the State Minister's Director? From 1st of June 2009, uh, I assumed that role full time, yes. All right, and what's the nature of that position? The nature of that position is one to provide care and support to pastors and churches within our movement. And uh, what is the way in which you do that? Oh, that's varied. Um, I travel constantly yes. throughout the state. Um, regular phone contact, um, take, accept and receive you know, calls, emails, whatever is necessary. All right. As part of your duties as state ministries directed, you have um, responsibility with respect to child protection policies of the ACC? 
Not directly, no. That's not directly my responsibility, no. Uh, all right. Now, if we go back to um, uh, the, the charging of Mr Baldwin in uh, 2007, you, you heard some evidence today about that particular issue. Yes. And um, as best we can establish, um, Mr Baldwin was charged by the police on or about the 24th of May 2007. Now, you understand that? That that's I've, the evidence now? I've heard that in this commission. Um, that was not my knowledge before now. All right. Now, I think you've addressed this in part in your, in your statement. Um, When was the first time that you became aware that, uh, that, that, that Jonathan Baldwin had been charged with um, child sexual abuse allegations? First time I became personally aware was at the State Executive Meeting on the 6th of December 2007. <clears throat> right. Now, you say that... Um, at paragraph 12 of your statement, and that'll just come up on the screen, the first time that the Queensland State Executive was officially made aware of the Jonathan Baldwin matter was when they were advised by Pastor Ashley Good that Jonathan Baldwin had been charged with assault against a minor, and you later discovered that the charge was not of assault, but of sexual offence. Yes. Correct. Yes. Um, so did you speak directly to Pastor Ashley Good? No, I, I did not, no. no. Uh, and how was that communicated through to the uh, State Executive then? My recollection is that that was a phone call from Pastor Good to uh, our then field officer, a uh, former staff member, uh, who then advised the Executive. Hmm. All right. Now, you heard the evidence earlier today that um, Pastor Good was contacted by uh, Pastor Peterson because his position, that is, Pastor Good's position, was as the, um, the, the district or the regional superintendent. Is that right? Correct. Yes. And which is it? Is it district or is it regional? What's the correct term? It is now regional. It used to be termed district. I yes. see. But effectively, it's the same position. Yes. Yes, it is. All right. Um, are you able to assist us at all as to the apparent delay in communicating those criminal charges from uh, from May until December of 2007. Is that right? Uh, the only comment I can make is that certainly the first knowledge we had and the advice that we were given, uh, it's been my understanding until this commission, was that uh, charges were not laid until November 2007. We, in conversations in 2008, I was given information uh, which indicated that Baldwin had been questioned by police in May or June of 2007, but at that point no charges were, were laid. Um, <clears throat> and. I thought that was referred to yesterday also in uh, Pastor Lehman's responses. Um, but the, the first we were made aware was definitely uh, uh, in late 2007. All right. Um, and uh, perhaps um, I may have misled you slightly with my questions earlier on. In paragraph 11 of your statement, you say that you recall that allegations against Jonathan Baldwin were first discussed on or around 13th of November 2007. That's, that's a precise date in November. What causes you to think that you became aware of the matter in, at that time? When, uh, when this matter came to my attention in 2011, um, with the email, uh, I immediately contacted our state office and asked the staff there to provide me with uh, records of every mention of Baldwin. Um, the only mention there was actually from an invoice uh, from our lawyers at the time uh, in discussion with the field officer, just said discussion concerning uh, Baldwin, a Baldwin matter. 
there was no detail uh, concerning that. So uh, I assume that was simply a discussion between probably the field officer um, and and our, uh, our lawyer. All right. Well, let's let's go back through it. Um, were you contacted on the 13th of November 2007 and told of the charges against Jonathan Baldwin? No, I was not. Um, how, do you, how do you know? You say the matter was first discussed on or around 13th of November 2007. Did somebody tell you that? <coughs> no, as so I uh, explained a moment ago, um, that information only... I was not aware of the 13th of November... Uh, date or no recollection of it until I asked for a search of our records. And so you're saying that there was a record? Yeah. Um, on, in preparing this statement for today, you looked back onto records and realised that there'd been some contact with um, the ACC in November of 2007? No, I... <clears throat> not in preparation for this, uh, these proceedings, no. I ascertained that information in October 2011, when oh, I see. we first when received the email. Yeah, we received the email from ALD. That's, that's correct. All right, okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. All right. Is there a protocol between um, the, the ACC and the Queensland Police about the reporting of charges of child sexual abuse against pastors, any pastors in uh, the ACC? Between AC, sorry, between ACC and the Queensland Police? Yes. Not, no relationship between the police and ACC, no. I mean, we obviously, as been said before, we have a mandatory reporting policy. Yes. But, but I'm not aware of any relationship specifically with the All Queensland right. Police. Are you aware of any steps taken by the State Executive of the ACC to establish such a protocol between the Queensland Police and the ACC for that information to be provided to it? No, I am not. All right. Now, one of the key measures within the administration manual, the National Administration Manual, is a process by which um, a pastor's credentials may be suspended. You understand that, don't yes, you? Sir. And um, that can be done by a number of bodies. The state executive is one of those bodies. Is that correct? It can be suspended. Only the national president and the national executive have the power, but the recommendation is made from the state executive to suspend, yes. yes. Were, you, were you aware of the uh, evidence that was received during the Hillsong part of the case study, which indicated that in urgent situations that the, I think the national president certainly can take steps to suspend credentials immediately? I'm aware not necessarily from the Hillsong case, but I'm aware of that yes. possibility. Is the same power vested in the president of uh, the state executive of the ACC, to your understanding? To my understanding, and I'm, I may be wrong, to my understanding, yes. I mean, if there's a critically urgent issue, uh, I would expect the state president could and would take uh, immediate action. All right. Now, you, you'd understand that once somebody has been charged with child sexual abuse allegations, it raises the possibility um, that there is a risk to children if that person has contact with children as part of their ministry. You understand yes. that? Yes. And that causes the urgency to consider whether the suspension of those credentials might be an appropriate course of action to take. Yeah, that would be fair comment. Yes. And so would you also agree that if there was timely communication between the Queensland Police and the ACC, that that would facilitate the consideration of the suspension of those credentials? I think um, I think it would be helpful. In fact, I've even had this thought the last couple of days. It would be helpful to have some protocol between uh, ACC and the police. Um, uh, that in the event, as happened here, that we were not immediately informed, um, yes, that would be helpful. All right. Now, after after um, the ACC was informed, and you estimate that the time was the 13th of November 2007, it appears that um, it was not until the 6th of December 2007 that the credential was actually suspended. Do you accept that? I accept that. Um, I would simply make the comment that 13th of November, there is no record of what that specific matter was about, only a phone conversation with the lawyer by a staff member. 
for it. Um, but I, I would accept that it probably was in some measure to do with that, but, yeah. Are you aware of any steps taken to establish whether Mr Baldwin, for example, was at that stage ministering to children? Uh, no, at that time we were aware that when we were made aware on the 6th of December, we were also aware that Mr Baldwin was not in any active ministry. He had returned, as I understand, to the Sunshine Coast, but was not in any active ministry role within ACC. See. And then the uh, the state executive went ahead and suspended his credential. Correct. And that's following the course uh, set out in the administration manual for pastors. That's right. Yes. Well, thank you. Is that a suitable time, Your Honour? Oh, yes. We'll take the lunch adjournment now.
opposed to um, an issue that arose yesterday, particularly during the examination of ALD and also Pastor Layman, um, because it relates to communications by um, this person, uh, Melissa Maines, who was then known as Melissa Lockwood, uh, concerning her observations of um, ALA and uh, Mr Baldwin together. Um, I understand Mr Kernigan has uh, uh, some comments to make about this document, but at this point I tender the statement of Ms Maines dated the 15th of October 2014. Do you want to make those comments? I take it they're not objecting to the tender, but commenting upon the contents. Is that right, Mr Kearney? Uh, not so much commenting on the contents, Your Honour. I don't object to the tender of that document. So yes. I'll, I'll mark the document as 18.0034. Thank you, Your Honour. Uh, my comment is directed at a related document that was tendered in yesterday's proceedings, which is Exhibit 30. Uh, which is uh, or was represented as an email uh, authored by the same person who authored the current, currently tended document. Yeah. Um, the observation that I make, and I make it for the benefit both of the Commission for Clarity but also for those watching and reporting on the proceedings yesterday, is that uh, much of the question to which my friend has referred was premised on the basis that what was contained in Exhibit 30 was indeed the evidence that Ms Lockwood would be expected to give. And there's no criticism of anyone who asks questions on that basis from me. But it is now apparent that Ms Lockwood would not give that evidence. Uh, she would give the evidence in the form that she has identified in the statement that's just been tendered. And it is at quite uh, some distance from what is contained in Exhibit 30. And that distance is important because it goes to the issue of specifically what uh, Pastor Lehman, as he then was, knew or was told, and it's apparent from the materials that have been uh, provided in the tender bundle to the Commission uh, that the principal source for information on that topic has historically been Ms Lockwood. Uh, she has now provided some clarification under a jurat in the document that's just been tendered, which, is, which falls well short of what uh, was put to my client yesterday in which uh, you heard him make certain uh, denials or disputes about the contents of what he was told. So it's important uh, for fairness to him that it's understood by those watching and reporting and, of course, by the Commission uh, that some of the propositions put to him yesterday in relation at least to what Ms Lockwood has said to have told him uh, are not entirely made out uh, as those things that Ms Lockwood herself says she told him. Yes, and in particular, Mr Kernigan, the, um, I, I can see paragraph 17 yes. um, makes clear that uh, Ms Lockwood now mains uh, states, I do not believe that I specifically informed Pastor Lehman of the incident regarding the sleepover at the church. Yes. Uh, because uh, it, I had previously informed him of my concerns and he'd taken no action. Yes, and the previous information uh, provided is de detailed in the newly tendered exhibit. Yes. Uh, and it too is quite different to that represented in the email that was tended yesterday as Exhibit 30. Yes. Uh, and that's of significance, obviously, from a point of view of fairness. All right. Thank and you. no doubt will be the subject of um, submissions. submissions on yes. the way in which the Commission should view... Uh, the evidence on this point. Thank you, Your Honour Commissioner. Thanks, Mr Beckett. Pastor Svensson, I think uh, just before lunch we were at the point at which uh, the matter concerning the suspension of Mr Baldwin's credential was uh, put before the State Executive. Yes. Um, and you were present at that meeting. Yes. And uh, and uh, the, the determination was made to suspend his credential in line with the administration manual. Correct. Um, do I, so I take it that um, at the date of that particular meeting, the 6th of December, you were aware that... You were aware that um, charges had been laid against 
Uh, Mr. Baldwin, is that right? That's Thank correct, you. yes. <coughs> All right. Well, in any event, um was the process um, at that stage in uh, 2007 as to um, the monitoring or um, keeping in touch with what the criminal justice process was with respect to a credentialed minister? So the criminal code is very broad. Yes, um, no, sorry, I've, perhaps I could, I'll put that in a, in, a, in a more precise way. So you're aware that there were criminal proceedings underway with respect to Mr Baldwin, yes. and you're aware that um, his credential had been suspended? Yes. And that the process involved um, at the ACC level was that um, if he was ultimately convicted of those charges, then the next process was that um, his credential would be withdrawn on a permanent basis. That's correct. All right. So there was a reason for it. To, as a result, there was a reason for the ACC to be monitoring or keeping abreast of developments at uh, the criminal proceedings level so that it could take that step in need, if need be. Is that right? That would be, that would be correct if he was wishing to pursue um, if, if he had been cleared of the charges and wished to the reinstatement of his credential, uh, and that, that really was his prerogative, not ours. Uh, but in terms of the former, that is to say, if he was convicted, then you would want to know about the conviction taking a place. I would want to place. know, correct. Yes. yes. Right. Now, I think you agree with me earlier that there was no protocol between the ACC and the Queensland Police yes. to assist you with that, That's and right. I presume that includes the Queensland DPP. That's correct. Yes. Um, so what step, if any, was taken at that stage by the ACC to make sure that it was advised of um, the outcome of the criminal proceedings? There, there were no specific steps taken regarding that particular um, matter. No. All right. Now, we haven't been provided with any documentation that went from the ACC to the pastor of the local church, that is... Pastor Peterson by that stage. So there was no process by which you would write to the pastor and say, if you become aware of the outcome of the criminal proceedings, then you can, can you please advise us? No. no. And similarly, you didn't write to the police or the DPP to say, we have a disciplinary process engaged as a result of these charges. Can you please provide us with um, notification as to the result of the criminal proceedings? No, we did not. Um, now, we understand from your statement, and I think from other statements as well, that um, the conviction which occurred in 2009 just simply didn't come to the, to the attention of the State Executive of the ACC, is that right? That's correct. And would you accept that as a result of not taking those steps to communicate with the police, with the DPP, or with the local church, the ACC had not set in place a process by which it could obtain that information. Certainly whether those were the appropriate steps or not, but they could have been, um, but certainly there were no steps put in place by which we would obtain that information. Yes. Yeah. And would you accept that as a failing of uh, the ACC? I would accept, I don't know, again, I wouldn't necessarily say it was those specific steps. Uh, they may be of help. Um, it, it was a failing that it did not remain on the agenda and was followed through, which I alluded to in my report. So if it had remained on the agenda, yeah. what would have happened? Well, had it remained on the agenda, then each time there was a state executive meeting, uh, there would have been, obviously, the question would have been asked, what's happened with this case? And so ultimately, 
two years later. Uh, but who was charged with the response? If, if that had been the case, it was sitting on the agenda, who was charged with the responsibility <coughs> for following up that particular matter? Well, it didn't remain on the agenda, so unfortunately, well, nobody you was charged. about that. Had, yes. had that been the case, I assume somebody would have been appointed to follow that through. So that that particular part of the of the way in which these matters have handled has now changed, as I understand it. Yes, I understand so. Um, and if that's the case, who would be allocated today that task, given uh, those circumstances arising again? I probably can't answer that. That would be a decision for the state executive at the time, but I have no doubt that. All right, we can ask the individual. Would we can ask Pastor Hunt that. Okay. All right, now. Uh, you're also aware by the time of the removal of the credential that, first of all, that the um, not only was the pastor accused of child sexual abuse, but it was of a member of his congregation. Did you, you understood that, didn't you? Initially, on the 6th of December, yes. the day of the executive meeting, uh, we were not initially aware. Our initial advice was simply that he'd been charged with assault of a minor, uh, subsequently, and I really can't tell you when, but subsequently we did discover it was not just common assault, it was a far more serious nature. Sentence. Was that known by the 6th of December? No, to my understanding not. What steps were taken by you or by the State Executive to determine what the nature of the child sexual abuse and particularly the charges were? We didn't take any particular steps um, to, my, to my recollection. I mean, that in itself was serious enough to suspend credential. So and it was in the hands of, obviously, the authorities. I understand that. But so, so you, you'd understand that, I mean, this, first of all, these were very serious charges being made against a practising minister of the Assemblies of God, as yes. it then was, I think. That's right, isn't it? Right. And the allegations involved sexual abuse of a child and that that was likely to have ramifications not only for the church but also for the Assemblies of God as a movement? Certainly for the local church, for the movement, uh, our responsibility, given the autonomy of the local church, our responsibility was to make sure that we dealt with the credential minister appropriately, suspending his credential. What... So, well, did your responsibility extend to offering or taking any responsibility for the victim of such a crime? Again, I would say that from an executive point of view in our movement, um, and it has been referred to here previously, our, our local churches are autonomous. Um, our connection, we have no jurisdiction, no right or access to members or attendees of local churches other than by specific provisions of their local church constitution whereby we may be, may be invited in. So I understand that, and I think we've heard that a number of times during uh, this particular case study. But you'd accept, first of all, that the proper conduct of credentialed ministers is a matter for the Assemblies of God, is it not? That's, that's correct. And it's, for, it's something that is considered by both the state and national executives as, as matters of utmost importance. Yes. And that, that is because it is those bodies that affect the provision of credentials as well as the withdrawal of credentials. Yes. Right. Now, in this case, you had a credentialed minister who had been accused of child sexual abuse. And are you saying that the responsibility of the Assemblies of God extended only towards the credentialing and not towards the victim of that abuse? My understanding would be um, we would certainly want to uh, exercise a pastoral responsibility and care responsibility for, and support to the victims. Uh, obviously, that was not possible when we were advised for the charges being laid because it was in the hands of the police uh, and the matter was to be determined. Um, well, so let me <coughs> just take you to that. First of all, do you accept that there appears to have been no contact between um, the, the ACC and ALA during the period between the charge and the conviction? Correct. That's correct, isn't yes. it? And similarly, there was no 
contact by the ACC or the Assemblies of God and ALA's family during that period as well. That's correct. So, Am I right in saying that no pastoral support was prov provided to those people during that entire period? From, from ACC as a movement? Yes. yes. Right. And do I also take it that no attempt was made to advise ALA or his family that there was a process underway under the administration manual to consider the credentials of Mr Baldwin? No, we, we would have assumed that the local church would have advised them of that process because the local church would deal with... Well, what steps were taken in December of 2007 to tell the local church that Mr Baldwin's credentials were removed? No steps were taken by the movement. In fact, well, how, he was how, not... How, how I was sorry. asking the witness... Okay, the witness. I, I apologise. Please continue. He was not a pastor in that church at that time... And uh, so, no, no steps were taken by the movement. How was that pastor going to be able to advise the family or in, of the fact that Mr Baldwin's credentials had been removed? It would be common process. I mean, obviously in a local church, in this particular case, he was no longer there. Um, and therefore... It would be the local church responsibility, uh, and it would become common fact under normal circumstances he was dismissed no longer there. All right. Well, you knew in this case that he'd actually moved on to another church. Yes. Uh, it just appears to be the case that no attempt was made to communicate with the victim or with the victim's family as to what process was going on within the ACC to discipline this, this man? We, we uh, only suspend the credential. At that point, he was, he was not proven guilty. He was obviously uh, charged. Yeah, but surely you were taking... The process was a serious process. You'd removed yes. this man's credentials, hadn't you? It was, it was suspended pending the outcome of it was, the trial. In terms of the action of the ACC, it was a good news story, if I can say that. In other words, you'd taken... As soon as you were aware of the matter, as I understand it at least, you took action to suspend his credential. What's wrong with passing that information on to those people who are aggrieved by the actions of um, a pastor of the ACC? There would certainly be nothing wrong with that, absolutely. Right. You'd say, in fact, it would be desirable to... Tell those people yes. what was going on with this particular pastor. I would accept it would be helpful that that communication comes from somewhere, by the local church, or if required, yes. All right. Now, we know that Pastor Peterson, who was providing pastoral support to ALA's parents, but had you established, or anybody else at the ACC, established that that pastoral assistance was being provided by him during that period between charge and conviction? Sorry, between charge and the... Conviction. On the conviction, no. No. And you say that you recognise that there was a pastoral obligation towards um, the victim and the victim's family, recognised at the ACC level. It appears to be the case that that obligation was not discharged during that period of time because there was simply no contact with those people. Correct. And is that part of the, the, the separation, if you like, between the ACC and autonomous churches, that really it's a matter for them and the ACC is not going to um, get involved, really? The, the hard intent of the movement would certainly be to ensure that victims are, are cared for, we would normally expect that to happen at the local church level. Um, yeah. All right. Um, then we come to the conviction in 2009. Um, in March of 2009, he's convicted and sentenced at that stage. Now, as I understand it... Well, let's, I'll start with you. Were you aware in March 2009 that he'd been convicted? 
No, I was not. In fact, personally, I was actually on a long service leave. I was, I was away. Yeah. All right. And um, are you aware of anybody else at the state executive level um, or anybody at the state office who became aware of that particular conviction? No, absolutely not. And do you accept that um, the failure to set things in place so that you could you could um, receive information about the conviction had meant that the state office just simply missed that particular part of the of the process. Yes, I, I acknowledge that, and in fact, that was the basis of the recommendation that I made in my report to the national executive. Yes. All right, and one of the things that happened as a result of that is that the state executive did not consider, certainly in March of 2009, that um, his credential should be um, withdrawn on a permanent basis. No, it had been surrendered, and obviously it, it, uh, that, was, that was its state, yeah. All right. Is the, process, is the process not that whether or not it's been surrendered, that it will be cancelled as a result of um, that conviction? Yes, in fact, <clears throat> if I can make comment just on the credential process, Mr Baldwin held a probationary minister's uh, credential. Um, and the fact is that even in normal circumstances, if someone is inactive in ministry, uh, that credential will lapse automatically at the end of that calendar year. So um, he returned, as I understand, uh, concluded his role at the Gold Coast in the end of 2006 and we returned to the Sunshine Coast. Uh, his credential under normal circumstances would have lapsed uh, by the end of the year anyway. Yeah. So what, what's the process then in that sort of circumstances to stop him from you know, waiting a year or two and then reapplying for a further credential? If he has been convicted, sorry. Yes, if, if he has been, been convicted, convicted yes. Of these offences, he will never. Uh, what's the it's very, very what's clear the, under our under our uh, code of conduct so, that. Uh, so he puts in an application. Let me give you an example. Yes. He puts in an application a year or two after he's been convicted of these yep. um, um, child sexual abuse allegations. Um, he then uh, he fills out the relevant form, I presume, sends it into the state office. What's the process which would uh, stop him from being granted that credential? Well, first, I'd make comment that for someone to apply for a credential, they actually have to be invited by a senior pastor to do that. Um, and no senior pastor, knowing the history, would do that. You, so you think it's unlikely that that would occur? Uh, and even if it did occur, he somehow submitted an application, there is no way in the world he would ever be... Yes. And that's because in the administration manual it makes clear that if you've been found to be uh, a convicted pedophile, for example, that you will never be able to minister again within the ACC movement. All right. Did you ever explain that to ALA or to his parents? Um, I explained that when uh, I met with him in Broome in 2012. Yes, all right. So... Uh, and that was some three years after the, the conviction, is that right? Yes. Um, and you'd accept that um, in 2009, if you'd been aware of the conviction, that you or somebody else from the state executive could have explained that part of the disciplinary process to them? Would have been happy to do that, yes, had we been aware. All right. Now, we know that the, the perpetrator of the child sexual abuse was a pastor a youth pastor within uh, uh, then Assemblies of God Church. We know that, don't we? Yes, we do. And you agree that? Yes. And that, um, that the victim was attending and being ministered to by that youth minister and by the church on the Sunshine Coast? Yes. That's correct, isn't it? Yes. And that that church was uh, an affiliated member of the Assemblies of God at yes. that stage? Yes. Yes. And by March of 2009, he'd been convicted. Uh, why was it not acknowledged by the ACC, by its senior members at the state level, first of all, that such abuse had occurred? 
simply because we were not aware. So it's simply, it's simply the case that really not until 2011 did you become aware of the conviction? That's correct. All right. Um, Can I also uh, ask you in this way, certainly if we go back to 2007, the decision to suspend, and you're aware of the criminal convictions at that time, one of the, uh, one of the matters I want to ask you about is that delay of between 2007 and 2012 in contact between the ACC and the parents and the victim appears to have been because at the start of the process in 2007, it appears that nobody was allocated the job of keeping up to date with the criminal proceedings and the pastoral needs of both ALA and his parents. Is that right? Yeah, correct. Yes. There was no process in place to ensure that the needs of those people were recognised throughout that process. Is that correct? That would be correct. Yes, yes. all right. Um, I'll just show you a document. Um, tender bundle 10. If that could come up on the screen, please. Now, sir, uh, this is not an email that was sent to you. It was sent to Pastor Peterson, and there's been some evidence about this today. You're aware of the email, are you? Yes, I've seen it here, yes. In 2009, did you receive a copy of this email? No, we did not. And if we go over the page to, sorry, to tab 11, we have a further email from Pastor Peterson to a number of people, including the directors of the Sunshine Coast Church. And there's, if we just scroll down there, um, we, we see and we heard evidence earlier this morning from Pastor Peterson that he'd contacted somebody called Steve at ACS. Um, are you able to assist us with that at all? Is there some was there in 2009 somebody at ACS called Steve that may have been involved in these matters? I, I can't comment with regard to 2009. Uh, I had contact with a Steve in 2011 uh, after the email was sent. Yes. All right. So is it is it likely that that's correct that the Steve is actually somebody at ACS and not at ACC? Well, it definitely wasn't ACC, I can tell you that. Uh, I can only assume that there was a Steve in ACS back then. Yeah. All right. So you were not aware in 2009 of any um, approaches by um, ALA or his parents to the ACC expressing concerns about the lack of involvement of the ACC? No, absolutely not. And then if we go, if we go ahead to um, the 11th of October 2011. First of all, do I take it that there was, to your knowledge, no communication between the ACC and, and ALA or his parents during that time? That's right. Now, there's a copy of the email of 11th of October at uh, tab 17, if that could come up. And so, first of all, we see that uh, this is a, a later email. The first one is dated early in the morning of the 11th of October, and this is an email from yourself to John Hunt. Was he the state president at that stage? Uh, yes, he was. And he, you're bringing to his attention the fact that you'd received a copy of the email from um, ALA's father? Yes, forward to me through another, <clears throat> another party, as I refer to there. All right, and, and you're aware of the contents of this of the email which is being forwarded? If we just scroll down, please. Yeah, I, I am aware, yes. And this is the email entitled, A Cry from a Father's Heart for His Sons. <coughs> Can you help? Do you see that? Yes, I do, yes. All right, now... I don't need to go to the detail of it, but certainly this is um, 
a heartbreaking email for anybody to receive, is it not? Yes. And he he recounts there the the fact of the abuse of his uh, of his son at the hands of a pastor of an Assemblies of God church. Correct. And. Um, the fact that the process that it was taking place four years after the um, after the conviction um, was taking its toll certainly on ALA and his family, yes. and that included um, the I think the compensation process, which was in full swing at that time. Sorry, are you saying the email included? I, I'm not sure whether <coughs> was that referenced in the email. All right. Um, if we go over to, uh, if we scroll down, please, to the paragraph that begins in all of this. Going, you see there at that last paragraph on the, on that page. It, in all of this, where is the church organisation, the AOG, that allowed this man to do what he did? hiding behind an insurance company. Do you see that? Yes, I see that. All right. So um, you knew after you read this email that there was uh, some form of claim process currently being undertaken um, with respect to... No, well, no, I did not know there was a claim, certainly when I received this email, and didn't necessarily conclude from that statement that there was because... Uh, again, any insurance claim would be a matter for the local church. All right, so yes. we'll just scroll down a little bit and you'll see that there are further references to there in that paragraph still, a bit more, thank you. Um, the church seems content to let the insurers try to minimise the exposure and damage to the organisation's reputation. Do you see that? Yes, I see that. And then if we go down, scroll down further, two paragraphs further, now we find that the church insurance company seem content to let more months drag by while they do their thing. You see that? Yes, I see that. And then the mediation is some period off after that and that there's a rhetorical question, who knows how much longer this torment will con would, sorry, could continue. Do you see that? Yes. Yes. So you knew from that, irrespective of whether it was the AOG's insurance or not, that there was a process of um, consideration of a claim um, by ALA. From that, yes, you would assume there was there was something happening. Yes. All right. Um, now, you referred that matter to Mr. Hunt. Um, if we just go back to Tender Bundle 13, we have an email, slightly out of date order, but um, 12th of October 2011, so the day after the email which had been sent by ALA's father. And you're familiar with this um, email from Juanita Foote? Yes, sir. And she responds to uh, Mr ALD saying that we recently received the below email and we are not sure if this is a legitimate email or spam. Do you see that? Yes, I do. So you hadn't responded that way. You thought it was of concern. I That's right. It, yes. Sorry. And you referred it to the state president. Yes, I did. Um, were you aware that um, Ms Foote had sent this email directly to Mr ALD? I was aware that there would be a response uh, to ALD. Yes. Um, yes. Now, it's reasonable, is it not, that um, on reading Mr ALD's email of the 11th of October, that it set out that there'd been clearly a long process oh. in which, for example, charges had been laid and there had been a criminal conviction? Yes. That's right. It's also clear that, um, that there was a process of he sorry, a, a process of counselling after that and some considerable pain experienced not only by LA but also by his family yes. um, and that there was a difficult insurance process going as far as they were concerned yes. through them and you also understood from the email that um, no approach had been made from, from the Assemblies of God 
to um, to the family or to ALA. That's right. Yes. Yes. All right. Now, in fact, with that with with that in mind, if you just look at the um, Ms. Foote's email, can you see that particularly that first paragraph might be construed as insensitive or cruel, perhaps? It could be construed as that, I, I understand, um, but in the context of the whole email and in the context that uh, it was a mass email sent obviously to many, many people, uh, but no one, certainly at a state executive level, was included on that list. Um, that raised question about the validity of the email. Uh, if somebody was genuinely reaching out to the movement... Didn't you see, having read that email, that the, the substance, the content of that email provided the legitimacy that you're talking about now? Not in itself, no. In fact, it was the first... I was aware of, obviously, the name Baldwin and what had happened there, the credential suspension. Um, that was the first time that I personally uh, was even aware of the name of the victim and his family. Um, you say in paragraph 24 of your statement, and I'll just have that brought up. You say, I forwarded the email to the state executive to bring the email to their attention. Mm -hmm. I recall that the state executive responded to the email immediately. Yes. Do you see that? Is that a reference to Ms Foote's yes. email to him? That's correct, yes. And then, however, we received no response from ALD. Do you see that? Yes. All right. So, so uh, an available way to read your comment there at paragraph 24 is that, effectively, the father d didn't take any steps to follow up on this clearly very emotional email that had been written to a large number of people. That's true. I mean, no steps were taken to follow up. Um, again, I'd reiterate that the... No, what I'm asking you is, in fact, about the interpretation of what you're saying, because if there's, a, there's an implied criticism there that the father didn't take appropriate steps to follow up um, with the AOG, notwithstanding he'd sent this significant email of the 11th of October 2011. The context of that is simply that there was a question as to the veracity of that email, uh, because nobody, as I said, nobody at a state executive level was on that mailing list, um, which was, I guess, waved the flag, well, is this real? Then... Um, well, sir, why didn't you write... Sorry, can I check? He was sorry. still answering. Yes, OK. I, I apologise. Thank you. Um, so, hence, I mean, it was, hence I drew it to the attention of our state president, uh, and because there was concern this could be very real and very serious, uh, that that email was sent uh, from Juanita Foote. Um, I agree, as you suggested, maybe it could have been sent a little, little callous, but, um, uh, but, again, there was a clear opportunity there um, when contact had not been made with the state executive, again, the opportunity and the offer was put there, please contact us. You subsequently received some advice, I think, from ACS about this matter. Is that, uh, is that correct? <coughs> correct, yes. <coughs> Just... Uh, tender bundle 15, if that could come up, please. So do I take it that um, the matter was raised with somebody by the name of Stephen Watson, who was an insurance claims officer at ACS? Yes. And um, if we just have a look at that email, it indicates that he'd been in contact with the parents, uh, sorry, with the father and the son, yes. and that there was uh, the current claim for compensation being considered. You see yes. that? Yes, I do. And then if we scroll down further, we'll see that 
I suspect that this feeling of abandonment may have started with support for Jonathan Baldwin being provided by his father-in-law, the pastor of the church. This sense of abandonment has been, may have been exacerbated when no official contact or support was received from the ACC or from the local church. Do you see that? Yes, I see that. Except from the current pastor. So that's a... It appears to me that Mr Watson understood what... Um, was being said to him by the father. Yes. Um, but at that stage, neither you nor anyone from the state executive had spoken to the father, had they? No. Effectively, it had been referred to the insurer and you were seeking advice from the ACS. We were asking where that was at <coughs> um, and helping to, I guess, confirm the veracity of the email contents, which uh, you know, alluded to an insurance claim Obviously, I became aware then, was advised by ACS, that there was mediation in process. All right. But he goes on and says, in order to rectify this apparent lack of support, so he was accepting what uh, uh, Mr ALD had said, wasn't yes. he? Yes. And he was confirming the veracity of the content of that email. Correct. And he says, I suggest that it might be appropriate for the ACC Queensland to respond to ALD's email... The response would ideally include an acceptance of the facts as they stand, that Andrew has been victim of an unconscionable crime. A simple explanation should detail what policies the ACC has in place to deal with these situations, in that credentials are immediately suspended upon presentation of accusations, and they are permanently suspended following proof of those accusations being established. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And the ACC may wish to acknowledge its commitment to... ALA and the family, as well as to other congregations around Australia, particularly children and youth, in the policies it has in place to protect them wherever possible. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And that's entirely reasonable, isn't it? Yes, it is. All right. In October of 2011, were those steps taken and communicated to the parents? No, not in October 2011, no. Well, were such actions taken to communicate those matters with um, ALA himself? Not at that point, no. No. And, in fact, if I can short-circuit the, the process, it's really not until you go and visit them in WA in July of 2012 that steps were taken to outline, outline those matters contained in this email of October 2011. That's correct, and there's a reason why why that was the case. Yes, please. What is the reason why? The reason was that uh, the advice was sound. However, I felt an email or a letter was too clinical and cold and not enough. I felt that, uh, obviously, once things were verified, I felt that the family deserved more than just an email or a letter. Um, obviously, this was discussed state and national level. Um, I felt they deserve the right to be able to talk to somebody personally. Why didn't you pick up the phone and speak to Mr ALD and say, look, there's, going, there's been a complete breakdown in communications, I'm very sorry, and then put those matters in the phone call to him directly? At that point, I didn't have his, we didn't have his contact details. Did you send him other an email the, and ask for them? Sorry, other than the email, which we asked for those details, which were not forthcoming. <clears throat> well, where is the email... Sorry. So are you saying that there is an email in which you asked for those contact details and were not provided with them? Well, the initial email from Juanita Foote asking for contact from ALD and that would have given us the contact details for, for the family. So you're saying that... Are you saying that the email from Ms Foote occurred after you received this information from Mr Watson? No, no not, not to my knowledge or recollection, no. Did you see the communication from Ms Foote and think to yourself, gee, we haven't handled that too well? No, I mean, I, 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 send the, I didn't send the communication from Ms Foote, but obviously it was authorised to be sent from our state office, yes. And then there seems to be a further delay. There's uh, <coughs> some contact. We know if we go to Tender Bundle 18... There's further contact, this time with the mother. 
starting in the 5th of April through to the 19th of April, where she reaches out and says, what's happening with this matter? Yes. Um, if I can just short circuit. She says, amongst other things, this is at Ringtail 87, where she says, thank you so much for your phone call yesterday, followed by your email. I had all but given up on hearing from Pastor Wayne Alcorn. I'm very mystified that you are not aware of this case as it took place so close to Brisbane. Do you see that? Yes. All right. And this kicks off a process which ends in you visiting them in WA in July. Is that right? In August, yes. All right. So effectively, notwithstanding the October cry from the heart from the father in October, it appears that all that occurred was that Ms Foote's email went to the family yes. and nothing further happened until the mother made further contact Correct. in April 2012. Now I understand from your from your evidence that so I'll just end that. So you went up to WA and you met with the family in, I think, is it August of 2012? Yes. Um, and you provided them with a number of apologies in, in terms of the way that the, um, the ACC and the Assemblies of God had handled the matter, and yes. is that correct? And they appeared to be happy with that and sent you um, texts to... That's to, correct, yes. Yes. All right. Um, did at any stage you write to them after that and put those matters formally in some form of letter to advise them of the things that Mr Watson had suggested you advise them in 2011? No, not in a formal letter, no. no. You didn't think that that was appropriate? I guess I had seen the letter in the light of being something cold and clinical, had followed through the course of action to meet with them personally, had expressed those... Uh, sentiments and thoughts to them very clearly at a personal level. Uh, so no, there was no formal letter to right. follow up afterwards. Now after, after that meeting in November of 2012, ALA contacted you and sought further counselling sessions That's correct. from the AOG and you agreed to provide those? Yes, we did. Yes. <clears throat> Are they generally available for somebody who has um, suffered from child sexual abuse in a, in a church of the Assemblies of God or the ACC? They would be. Uh, obviously, this is a very rare occurrence, but yes, we would certainly make that available. If first port of call, obviously, will be the local church. Um, but yes, if, if that's not possible from there, then, then from a movement perspective, yes, we'd want to make sure that adequate support and care was provided. Yeah. Now, um, in your report that was given to the um, to the state executive, and uh, you've exerted some parts of it in your statement, and I'll go to your statement first, if, uh, if we can, at paragraph 39. indicate there, first of all, that a number of issues and failures were identified by you in that report. Is that right? Correct. Yes. And one of those issues was, uh, you say, at point one there, a failure by a senior pastor, Ian Lehman, to inform anyone or take any action when serious concerns were made to him because of a conflict of interest being that Jonathan Baldwin was his son-in-law. Do you see that? Yes, sir. Um, at the time the, that the abuse and um, suspicions of abuse were coming forward, and that was the period 2004 to 2006. Do you understand that? Yes. Was there any conflict of interest policy in place at the Assemblies of God or the ACC? 
In regard to what specifically? In regard to making decisions where a senior pastor of a church <coughs> had a conflict in the sense that it related to something concerning a benefit that may have been provided to a relative, for example. Most and things to do with conflict of interest generally will be uh, part of local church policy and local boards for the board of the local church to put in place the necessary governance documents for that local church, including conflict of interest issues. So do I take it from that that there was no policy recommended about conflict of interest from the ACC state level? Not specifically, not that I'm aware of. All right. Uh, Uh, you go on in, if we go over the page there. Sorry, I would make this comment if I... Um, Please, you want to continue your answer, yes. Um, there certainly would have been advice in board training seminars that were conducted by a movement uh, for, in general terms about conflict of interest. Yes. So... Whilst it's the responsibility of the local church to put that in place, certainly our pastors would be advised to make sure that those appropriate, you know, regulations or whatever are put in place, guidelines are put in place for the local church. Do you recall a specific document that includes that? No, I can't. I'm sorry. All right. Um, and then if we go further... I'd Additionally, I understand that Jonathan Borden was arrested by police in June 2007. Again, no report of this arrest was made to the ACC State Executive, either by Jonathan Borden or Pastor Ian Lehman, and actions were therefore unable to be taken. Do you see that? Yes. All right. So there's an indication there that you're being critical of those people, Jonathan Baldwin and Pastor Lehman, for not alerting the State Executive. Is that reasonable? Yes. Do you not consider that it was, in fact, the ACC that had responsibility for monitoring such matters as um, um, concerning both the charging and the conviction of Mr Baldwin? No, because I'm not sure how it would be reasonably possible to monitor everything that happens in everybody's life. So <laughs> we have a clear... Said... Sorry. Yes, please go. Continue. We have very clearly spelt out in our <clears throat> administration manual uh, the responsibility upon uh, a pastor to advise. Uh, obviously, if he is uh, convicted, um... yes. So there's an obligation in the administration manual for the pastor concerned to advise. Otherwise, hey. how, how else are we to know, as an executive to know, yes. unless they are advised? All right. Well, well, two things. There's, certainly, I, I understand what you're saying in terms of a charge, but uh, I think you agree with me earlier. There's no agreement or protocol with the Queensland Police or the DPP to communicate that sort of True. information to you. True. And you realise that that's an... Uh, sorry, I think you accepted that that's an available opportunity, uh, avenue for you and the ACC to pursue... Certainly, to explore. <coughs> um, all right. And you were aware... You knew you were aware of the uh, of charges being laid in the early point... Yes. ..in um, 2007, and I think you accepted from me earlier that there was a, a failure of the ACC to monitor those charges to the extent of making it known to those with the information that they could tell you when a conviction or an acquittal was recorded. Yes. Yes. All right. Um, now, following, uh, following your report, um, was any, um, any review made of um, the state ACC policies um, with respect to what had happened at the Sunshine Coast Church with um, Mr Baldwin and uh, his abuse of ALA? <coughs> Excuse me. I know the recommendation was, was accepted. Um, uh, yes. And that recommendation was to, was to keep... The matter on the state executive on the agenda. agenda. Yes, right. until the matter was resolved. So I should have explained it more comprehensively. I want to move to a slightly different matter... 
and that is um, you understand in this case, for example, that um, for a considerable period, Pastor Ian Lehman appears to have not reported allegations, suspicions of child sexual abuse to either the Department of Child Protection or to the police. Do you, do you understand that? Yes, I object to that. Um, I'd ask my friend to particularise which period he's referring to. If, if my friend's referring to the post-2006 period or if he's referring to the 2004 through 2006 period when Pastor Lehman had responsibilities because obviously it's of some import. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll clarify that. Um, I'm talking about the 2004 to 2006 period. Yes. Well, then I object. I maintain my objection because there's no evidence in support of the the contention that's being put as the premise of the question. And if, if it is put that he did not communicate his concerns as to an intense relationship, then I have no objection to that. I could have no objection to that. But if my friend is putting a specific object, uh, a specific complaint to Pastor Lehman of sexual abuse, I would ask where is the evidence in support of the contention that Pastor Lehman received such a complaint? I'll put it, I'll put it this way. Um, Sir, did you understand that Pastor Lehman had been provided with evidence either through seeing it himself or from other people at the Sunshine Coast Church, that there was um, a high degree of favouritism shown to ALA. Did you understand that first? My only understanding of those matters was from my conversations with the family, with uh, All right. well, let, the family. Well, let, yeah. let me put uh, the scenario to you. First of all, that there's a high degree of favouritism that there were, that um, the sorry, past... Um, sorry, can I ask where that terminology... I don't think I used that terminology, did I? No. Yes, no, I'm not saying oh, you sorry. did. I'm not saying you did. Sorry. I'm saying that um, did you become aware that there were a number of um, matters known or put to Pastor Lehman concerning his interaction with ALA? And I'll go through them. The first of all was a high degree of favouritism. Oh, um, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll just yeah. High degree of favouritism. There was um, accompanying or riding in a car with um, uh, with ALA on a number of occasions. There was ALA visiting um, the youth pastor at the Gold Coast um, after two thousand and five, um, and there were a number of communications about. Favoritism from senior members of senior members of the Sunshine Coast Church, including um, purchase of some drumsticks as a gift for this young man, and the provision of numerous awards to him. Did you come to know about that material at some stage? I did not come to know about many of the specific instances. There was general conversation with uh, ALA's family yes. uh, concerning those issues, but uh, I don't recollect that some of the specific ones were, were raised. Some were, some were not. Well, you understood that um, the child sexual abuse occurred during a time when Pastor Lehman was the pastor at the church? Yes. And... Um, did you come to a view as to um, whether he was aware of that abuse or suspected such abuse or should have suspected such abuse? Based, based on my conversation with, uh, with the family, yes. I object, Your Honour. I'm not sure the basis upon which my friend asks that question of this witness, given what this witness has already told the Commission is the source of his information about what Pastor Lehman was told and knew. It's, it's a question that invites a speculation on the part of this witness, which is of such loose quality that it couldn't be of assistance to the Commission in my respectful submission. 
it would be different if this witness had received that information from a more direct source or that the information was more particular. Uh, but my friend has just taken the witness through a number of instances that do not amount to child sexual abuse and then has essentially invited the witness to join him in a logical leap. And that's the objection that I make. Well, the question, the, the question's been answered, but um, what I wanted to establish next was what he was told, that is, what this witness was told by the family about Pastor Lehman's involvement, if anything, in knowledge of or the abuse that occurred at the church. The, uh, the evidence, where what conclusions can be drawn from this evidence are, are limited based on um, your objection. But I, I think Mr um, Beckett is going some, somewhere else with respect to um, his examination of this witness. If your concern... Um, I, I, I understand your concern. Yes, uh, Your Honour. And it, it's based around the limits of... Um, what conclusions can be drawn from this evidence? But just just bear with the process for a moment. No, please. I'll be quite clear about where I'm going. Essentially, I'm asking you, sir, whether. ensure that in future such failures or such negligence did not occur? Again, we don't have the ability to be involved in the local church matters uh, on their own. It's the responsibility of the local church. We would certainly make sure in terms of pastors or leaders, I mean the church was under new leadership uh, by then. And, of course, uh, the family had been very forthcoming in their appreciation of Pastor Peterson, the then pastor. Uh, so we had no ongoing concerns. This related specifically to that particular situation. And I pointed out in my report that there were some particular peculiarities with this case, which were very unusual. Did you... <clears throat> Did you or anybody else at the state executive, to your knowledge, conduct a review of um, the child protection policies adopted by this particular church? Not of that particular church, no. Um, why, given, given that there appeared to be some failings of the senior pastor that was there, was it not logical to have a look at um, what they were doing, what the church was doing, to guard against child abuse within the church? It's a movement. We have, uh, I think, taken steps to do everything we can to educate and encourage our pastors to put in place appropriate, uh, appropriate steps and appropriate policies. Uh, I, I 
can enlarge on that if, if you wish, but, but uh, there's an expectation upon our pastors to avail themselves of that, that, that they are strongly encouraged, and adequate, in fact more than adequate, opportunities are provided through various ways. So you heard uh, Pastor, uh, Pastor Layman's um, evidence yesterday, I presume? Yes, sir. And uh, also Pastor Peterson's <coughs> Excuse me. Yes. evidence today. Uh, yes. We appear to have two pastors, neither of whom availed themselves of that detailed material that's provided at the state executive level. Would you, would you agree with that summary of the evidence? Yes, sir. And do you see that there seems to be a gap, a problem at that stage in terms of the implementation of these very detailed policies that the state has when it comes to the local level? Do you see that? I certainly see that, um, yeah. And the state has taken the step of, I mean, providing these very detailed policies and also provides assistance where needed, yes. where approached by a church for that yes. to occur. Yes. But it appears at the next level down, at the church level, those matters don't seem to be making their way through to those at the front line, those who are charged with looking after and uh, dealing with child protection issues. I would accept that in some cases that certainly is, would be the case and certainly was the case here. Yes. And don't you think that, given that scenario, that, that it was an appropriate time to review, as a state body, perhaps even as a national body, and I'll raise this with Mr Alcorn, to review the degree to which those policies are able to be implemented properly at the local church level? I do know, and I can't comment because I'm not a, now a member of the state executive, I'm an employee. I do know that at national and state level, there are constant reviews of process um, in regard to these matters, so I, I would assume that is definitely the case. Yes. However, yes. if I can, I, I would just again make the point that we do not actually have an executive in this movement, state or national, does not have the power to come into a local church and say, you must adopt this or to enforce certain things upon their board in terms of policy. We do everything we can to provide and encourage them. Yes, well, I'll ask some further questions of the next two witnesses about that. Thank you very much. Those are my questions. Mr. Decker. Mr. Kernigan. Thank you, John. Sir, uh, my name is Aaron Kernigan and I act for Mr. Lehman. Um, you say uh, in evidence that you've just been giving. Um, and this is a reference to page, uh, sorry, transcript 9930 at line 42. You're asked a question by counsel assisting, you're being critical of those people, Jonathan Baldwin and Pastor Lehman. Uh, this is in respect to a failure to report to the state ACC the yes. arrest of Mr Baldwin. Yes. And you remember that... Uh, you were asked this question, do you not consider that it was in fact the ACC who had the responsibility for monitoring such matters as concerning both the charging and the conviction of Mr Baldwin? And your answer was no, because I'm not sure how it would be reasonably possible to monitor everything that happens in everybody's life. Uh, you give a non-responsive comment after that. Are you saying that so far as you, you're concerned... It's your opinion that in 2007, at the time of the arrest of Mr Baldwin, that Mr Lehman had a responsibility to inform the state ACC of Mr Baldwin's arrest? Sorry, could you just... Uh, just the time frame again. Could you repeat the question, sorry? As at the time of Mr Baldwin's arrest, do you say that Mr Lehman had a responsibility to inform the state ACC of that arrest? Under ACC policy, because he was no longer an ACC pastor at that point, uh, no. However, I would personally hold that he would have had a responsibility to advise us, knowing that, his, knowing that he had been a member of a, a credential minister of ACC and that Baldwin had also been. Yes. So today, is that your view? Yes. You expect that any pastor, past or present, affiliated with the ACC would come forward and report such a matter to the state ACC? If they were aware of child abuse allegations against a 
credential holder with the NICC? Yes. Well, that's not the question I asked you. I asked you if, you if they were aware of the arrest of a pastor or a former pastor, you would expect today any past or present pastor to make such a report. Is that correct? Certainly a present pastor. You know, obviously arrest covers a wide range of things, but... Uh, what about a past pastor? What about a past... A former pastor. former pastor. If they were aware... Um, and particularly, and I would like to draw a distinction between arrest for maybe many things and the subject of this, this Royal Commission, which is child abuse, that I believe that any member who has held a position or, you know, even retired and is aware of a current serving credential holder, if they're aware of it, I would think they have a moral obligation to report that, at least, at the very least. Does that mean that the purpose of your report was to make judgments of the moral failings of senior pastor Ian Lehman? The basis of my comments in that report, as I uh, explained to the Assistant Council, was the fact that post fact the conviction, meeting with the family of the abused, the victim, um, and being advised that concerns had been raised with Pastor Lehman and he had not acted on them on that basis, I formed an opinion that he had been ne negligent. So in saying that, do I understand you to allow for the possibility that if the basis upon which you have just expressed, you made those findings, was not correct, you would have a different view about his failings or otherwise? If Pastor Lima or any other pastor is not aware uh, of, of concerns, uh, then they couldn't possibly, and therefore I wouldn't hold them responsible. They are not aware. Um, you used the term concerns both in your evidence and in your report a number of times, and specifically in uh, your <coughs> report, which you've been taken to... Um, I'm sorry, in your statement, rather... Perhaps we'll put that on the screen. Paragraph 39, Ringtail 5, page 5. You'll see at the head of this page, the leading paragraph there, that uh, go down. Thank you. The first paragraph there <coughs> is what we're referring to. you see the concluding sentence, if those concerns were reported... You make a finding there. You yes. see that? Yes. It doesn't seem to matter here to you what the concerns have to be. Is that right? No, it does matter. The concerns were in the context of a conviction record of child abuse. Well, I'll just stop you there. Yes. That can't be right, can it? You're talking about acts by Pastor Lehman that predated the matter going to the police. The acts were my conversation with the family after from where I gleaned this information and for my opinion uh, was post, post the conviction. Right, but you're talking about concerns being reported to Pastor Lehman. Absent conviction or criminal process... Does it matter to you what the concerns are or is the effect of what you've written here to indicate that basically because you were told Pastor Lima didn't do anything, you could effectively pin responsibility on him? If he was aware of serious concerns in the context of this case and he did not report, then I would hold him responsible. Right. Yes. And, of course, in preparing such a report as this, you, you uh, conducted yourself in a professional manner. Endeavour to, yes. Conscientious and thorough. Try to. So you spoke to Pastor Lehman? No, I not. You interviewed him about what he knew? No. You sought his version of events? No, I did not. Do you think now that that would have been a sensible cause? Not necessarily. If Pastor Lehman was still a member of the ACC, definitely that would have been an important step to take.
Yes. But because he wasn't, you didn't think that uh, it was viable to engage in such a process? No. Did not see any point in that. So you turned your mind to it? No, I can't say that I did. Didn't even think about it? No, I saw no, no point in that. Pastor Lehman was no longer with ACC. This was an internal recommendation. Yes, thank you, Your Honour. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, Mr O'Brien. Thank you, Your Honour. Uh, O'Brien is my name. I, I represent uh, Mr ALA and his mother and father. Um, so, so the situation, sir, is that um, the state level of the ACC didn't come to find out about the charges for quite some time. Correct. Uh, and um, there was also a delay in finding out about the conviction of yes. Baldwin as well. And um, that's because the information failed to travel from the local level to the, to the state level of the ACC. That's the summary of your evidence, isn't it? Correct. And... And as I acknowledge, failure of at the state level, state executive level, to monitor the trial process. Yes. Uh, so you, you acknowledge failing for his no doubt you've uh, un, uh, endeavoured to rectify. Yes. Yes. But in the meantime, of course, there's a family. Um, there's a son, a uh, victim of child abuse, horrendous child abuse. You acknowledge that. Yes. And there's a mother and father. Uh, who have desperately pleaded in an email to all the churches associated with the AOG that they can get emails to, to help. That's what they did, isn't it? Yes. And eventually that came to your desk at the state level of the ACC. Yes. And you're a member of the state level sent back what's been described as a fairly could be described as a fairly callous email, and you've accepted that's the case, correct? Correct, yes. You got some advice from your insurance company, look, deal with this delicately, deal with it sensitively, take it seriously. The that, insurance... That, that was the effect to, of the advice? To me, yes. 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 And again, there was a period of time before anything was done at all, yes. correct? Correct. And all the while still, this is years later then, there's a child abused and there's mum and dad, right? Years later, not from when we became aware, but yes. Years, but but, years but later, since the charge has been laid, yes, since the, yes. the offence has been committed, yes. that process is ongoing. You come to be told by your insurance company, look, best deal with it sensitively, but yet there's still a delay between when this all happened and the ACC response, correct? And you accept that that, in and of itself, that delay there at that point caused continuing pain for the victim of the abuse, first of all? Yes. And for his family? I, yeah, that would be you obvious from, that, from their... I would assume that from their, their uh, letter, from the email, yes. And eventually the first personal contact, the first personal contact being face-to-face -face contact didn't occur until August of 2012. Face-to-face -face contact, there had been phone contact prior to that. And they were delighted to see you. I don't know that I'd use the word delighted, but they were certainly very, very gracious and very welcoming, yes. Well, that's good. And, and they sent you some texts saying, thanks for seeing us. Yes. Can you understand the pent-up anger that would be felt by a victim of child abuse between, between the offences occurring and reporting it to the police and all those years later when, in almost five years later, in fact, since the offence is many more years than that, but after the charging process... Yes, I can understand that. ..so you meet face to face. Yes. And... and, and, and since that meeting face to face with you, have you met face to face with Mr. ALA? No, not not met face to face. No, he was interstate. Uh, we had phone contact, number of phone conversations. He, he sought some counselling assistance from you in 2012, in November. Correct. And there's been no contact from you or anyone from the ACC with him since. 
other than, no, there's been no contact. I would make comment as I had originally, and I said to ALA, please let me know, as he'd done in November 2012, if there's any further way in which we can help, please contact me. I've had no further contact from him. Do you invite from him contact on that basis, any further help that he might be able to get from you? Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. Yes. I, I want to make something absolutely clear, if not to you, to those listening to the, commis uh, to the Commission. Uh, ALA is extremely angry with the ACC at a state level and with the and at a, at a Commonwealth level. Do you understand that? I don't understand that now. I have no you didn't basis know that. on which I certainly understood that when I met with uh, with him in Broome. Yes, and. I'm telling you now so that you understand it and you don't have to respond if you don't want to. He's still extremely angry with the I, ACC. I to this. If he has a question, he should ask it, rather than making statements with respect. Well, the question was whether or not this witness knew that, and that's been asked and answered. So you're unaware that he's still very angry to this day with how he's been treated? Yes. Did the ACC attempt to contact him or his family in the lead up to the, these proceedings? No. Did it think to reach out to him and say, "How are you going? What's 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 life like now? Have you have things improved? Are you dealing with it better?" Did you think to do that? No, no, I did not. Did you think to go back to him at all since 2012 and see how he, as a young member of your church, was coping now after this horrendous abuse? Uh, let me just correct. He's not a member of my church or the executive's church. He was a member of a local church. But, uh, no, I haven't a member been... of your, your, your movements. Sorry, right. I think no. the witness was about to add something, so I appreciate an opportunity for the witness to finish his answer. Uh, he is a member or an attendee of a church that is a part of the Australian Christian churches, yes, uh, that's, that's correct. Um, what I was going to say was that my last conversation with... Make, is it? I'm not suggesting how he saw it. Um, I'm, I'm stating the fact that that it was a local church response. He wasn't a member of ACC. He was a member of a local church which is affiliated with ACC. Do you think it's fair that he might have seen himself when he was going to the church as a young, as a as a youth and a teenager, that he was going to a church? that was a member of a broader organisation of churches? I can't really speculate, speculate on how he saw it, but that would be possible. Hmm. And when he... Could you therefore contemplate that when all of this happened and he was trying to work out how he's going to best deal with it, that he might have seen not the individual church has been responsible, but the organisation under which this church was existing is somewhat responsible too. He, he may well have, and certainly from uh, his parents, 
and certainly his father's email, uh, yes, that would be a reasonable conclusion. Well, the father's email in October 2011 certainly made it clear, didn't it? That's how he saw it, yes. That's how they saw it, yes. But you agree, you saw it totally differently, didn't you? You saw the church as being the responsible party and the ACC as being something other than responsible. No, that's not correct in terms of... Certainly the local church has first responsibility. Uh, but to say that, that ACC as a movement was other than responsible, no. Um, and that is evidenced by the fact that uh, I personally engaged with the family. Late that was, and we've acknowledged that, and there were failings in that process. But if, if we accepted no sense of pastoral responsibility and well-being to see that they were cared for, uh, I, I wouldn't have done that. We wouldn't have done that. Um, God forbid this would happen to some other young fellow in a church affiliated with um, the ACC. But if it did, and they also had a view, like my client and his family did, that I'm part of a ch broader church movement, not just my church, but I can go to another state and go to church and participate in a similar movement, uh, to, in a similar church in a different state, that, that they might hold, if it happened to them, the ACC responsible in some way if there were a failing such as there was in this case? I would assume that could be a possibility that people may... I, I can't really answer that. It's very speculative, to be honest. Well, would, you, would you answer them in the same way that you answered my earlier question? Would you say, oh, you're not a member of the ACC, Mr Victim of Abuse... You are a member of a little church in a little suburb in a small town in Victoria or I, South Australia. You're not a member of the ACC. Is that how you'd respond to them? Well, sorry, I object to that. It's never been this witness's response. And, in fact, this witness has said on a number of occasions now they acknowledge their failings, that the state executive and the board of movement should have been given support, and that was done. I mean, council assisting went over this in great detail. Uh, I'm really concerned about the repetitive nature of this questioning, with respect. No, I, I'm not. I'm not um, quite cross-examining this witness for anyone else's benefit except my clients, uh, my clients' parents, mm. and for the commission. Um, if it's repetitive, I apologise. But uh, this is an intelligent, and articulate witness, and he's capable of understanding that question. I'll allow the question, Mr. O'Brien. In which case, I would need you to, to define member. So, so is that what you'd say to the victim of abuse? Can you define member for me? Am I a member no, of the ACC not... or am I a member of the, the small congregation in the small local town? You understand the point I'm making, don't you? I understand the point you're making, Mr O'Brien, um, but I, I'm wanting also for you to understand that and that's why I asked for you to define... You, you put the question to me about him being a member of ACC, the broader movement. AC, ACC's membership consists only of churches or, and pastors, not, not local members of local churches. They may be a member of a local church, uh, but, but attendees or local church members are not members of Australian Christian churches. Our church, local churches are autonomous. Uh, you see, I'm not talking about membership, sir. Well, I'm, I'm talking, sorry, I'm talking term, about who a person might sheet responsibility to. And my client and his family sheeted some of the responsibility to, to your organisation. Do you understand why that might happen? Yes, I do understand why that might happen, yes. Do they come in and sign a membership form at the, uh, at the local church describing themselves as a member of this organisation or a member of your organisation? Do they do that? Every local church has its own particular 
sets of rules. Do they do that in any of the churches you're familiar with? Some, some have uh, a membership, a local church membership. Depends on their local constitution how they're structured legally. And, 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 and they then told, oh, well, it, look, if something silly or untoward, something, something untoward happened to you, uh, the umbrella organisation not responsible uh, for it, that will be dealt with by the local church. Is that what they're told in these membership on these membership forms? There's some sort of. I, I can't. Can I make, raise an objection about the form of the question? What does he mean by responsible? Yes. Do, 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 does the membership of the of the local church somehow mean that the ACC is then not responsible if something untoward would have happened? For example, sexual abuse. The ACC's responsibility, first and foremost, is to its members, and that is, as, as you've rightly used, it's an umbrella organisation, an affiliate organisation of churches, under which ministers are credentialed. Um, we have, as I stated earlier today, an executive or members of executive in the movement have no jurisdiction, no right. In fact, it would violate local church constitution to just walk into a church without proper invitation. Uh, we do not have that right as a movement. Um, having said that, I acknowledge that we would not want to see any victim of abuse uncared for. Absolutely. And our, I'll leave it there. Mr Svensson, does it follow from what you say that the members of the ACC are the ordained members of the church and not the members of the congregation. That would be that's largely correct, Your Honour. Yes. So lo yeah, local church members, if a local church has a membership, are not members of the ACC movement. No. Do you think that's well understood by the members of the congregation, Mr. Swenson? I'm not sure, Your Honour. I th many, I, I would say today, maybe 30 years ago, many people may have felt they were part of then Assemblies of God. Um, there would be many people in, I think, many of our churches today who would not even be aware of what ACC is. They, our churches operate under local names. Many of them, you know, have no reference to Australian Christian Church, Bondi, or wherever it might be. Um, so uh, I, it's difficult to answer that. Yeah. So the governance structure, um, that's put in place for the ordained members of the um, affiliated churches, yes. that governance structure. Yes. And that governance structure, have we understood this correctly, offers... Um, some sort of leadership role. Yes. Some uh, some uh, opportunities for ongoing um, professional development, be it either faith based or with respect to general management of of an organisation, such as the development of policies for child protection, for that example. Would be correct, yes with no capacity to um, enforce uh, any of uh, those um, policies or the development of any form of training, but only to encourage. That would... I'd probably... You know, I'm not a legal expert, and I, I guess... I'm trying um, to use plain English. Yeah, no, I, I understand your question. Legal. I'm just not sure. I, I would think that would be correct. And that the only, in fact, the only, um, I suppose, in enforcement role or power that the, if we've understood this correctly, power that the um, top tier of the organisation has at, an, at a national level is the um, credentialing of the members. Is that correct? Through the credentialing uh, and the code of conduct that's framed around that, uh, and through the provisions of the United Constitution of the Movement, 
in which, you know, obviously things are spelt out, which set the terms for membership by, by uh, ordained ministers and particular local churches. So the, so, um, the ACC can um, remove the credentials of an individual member yes. or, uh, I'm not sure if I have the language correct, but um, disaffiliate an individual uh, local church. Yes, that would be correct. Sorry, Mr O'Brien. No, not mean, at all. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, As um, this Royal Commission approached um, and um, leading up to it, that you didn't get in touch with the with ALA or his family. You've, you've said as much. Well, that question uh, has been put and answered, yeah. Mr. O'Brien. And do, do you have a reason as to why you didn't do that? To be honest, uh, I mean, I wasn't uh, aware that that uh, ALD and ALC would be present. Um, uh, I thought it may have even been inappropriate to make contact with them prior to this. I, you know, uh, yeah. Thanks, nothing. Thanks, Mr. Might go last year. Yes. If I might briefly, Mr. Your Taylor. Um, Mr. Swenson, my name's Taylor. I appear on behalf of Christian Peterson. Yes. Um, we we'll just take you to your statement of the 29th September, uh, paragraph 12, that's at ringtail 2. Just have a look at paragraph 12 for me. Yes. Uh, firstly, uh, use the word officially. Um, was there any unofficial reporting? No. And Pastor Ashley Good, um, she was on the uh, district or regional executive, is he, that correct? He was the regional leader, yes. Thank you. And um, are you able to say, by reference to a date, what was the first time you refer to in paragraph 12? Uh, as I said earlier, the first time as an executive, first time I became aware and the first time as an executive we became aware was on at the executive meeting on 6th of December, if I recall the date correctly. And um, we've got copies of the, uh, the minutes of that meeting. Um, to my eye, um, Ashley Good wasn't present. No, he was not, because he was not a so, member of the state executive. So how did Ashley Good convey that information? I understand that was by a by phone call to a staff member, as I understand. Are you able to say when that was? I My understanding was, in fact, uh, only in days before, uh, days before the executive meeting. Is it correct to say the state executive only met in 2007 on two no, or three had, occasions? Usually there are four meetings most, most times. So about every three months or so? Yes. Is that a, a fluid situation? Generally it's fairly, fairly standard, uh, usually beginning of the year, um, early in the year, June, you, September, end of the year, November, December. Are you able to tell the Royal Commission when the previous meeting was to the 6th December 2007 of the State Executive? I'm sorry, I don't, I'd be happy to, but I don't have that information uh, to hand. Thank you. Now, um, in your <coughs> position um, on the State Executive, you prepared a report dated the 4th September 2012, you remember? Yes. Preparing that report. Um, did you interview Mr Peterson um, prior to preparing that report in relation to these issues? I didn't interview him immediately prior to that report. I had lengthy phone conversations with 
Chris Peterson, uh, upon receipt of the email from ALD in the previous October. So, um, and probably some subsequent ones, but I, I can't remember specifics. Yeah. Um, is it the situation <coughs> that um, in those conversations you had with Mr Peterson, uh, you, you didn't disclose to him that you were preparing a report and you wanted some input from him? No, I mean, the major conversations with Pastor Peterson uh, were a long time before that report was even uh, thought of, yeah. And um, do I take it, therefore, that um, in preparing the report you had no um, direct information from Mr Peterson about what occurred in this matter? You were relying on the historical... I was relying on the... Very lengthy conversations we had on the 11th, 12th of October, I can't remember the exact day, uh, in 2012, uh, in which Pastor Peterson outlined the, the care and support he provided for uh, for the family, of which we were very grateful. Yeah. Well, to be fair to you, your report's dated the 4th September 2012. Yes. So you couldn't have spoken, relied upon October 2012 lengthy oh. conversations, could you? Sorry, 11. Oh, thank you. 11, sorry. Yes, I've nothing further. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. There's just one matter I want to uh, uh, clarify, if I may, Mr. Swenson. Um, could tab 15 be brought up, please, of the Sunshine Coast tender bottle? It should come up on the screen. You were shown this by council assisting. Uh, this was a uh, communication in writing to you from Stephen Watson from ACS, correct? Correct. All right. And it's dated the 12th of October 2011? Yes. All right. And the first sentence is, thank you for your time on the phone this morning. Can you recall what time that conversation was you had with uh, Stephen Watson? Uh, no, in fact... To be honest, I'm surprised at the date heading on that. Um, I thought my initial contact was with another person, uh, female, at ACS. Um, I, my recollection was, to be honest, that my conversation with Stephen Watson was at a later date. Well, uh, this, uh, it seems, would be an email sent to you. Uh, if it was sent on the 12th of October 2012, you were able to say whether that's correct or not? If it was sent, yes. If, if it was, uh, sorry, can you... I said, I mean, I should have said 12th of October 2011. So I'll ask my question again. Yeah. Thinking back now, given the date of that correspondence, are you able to say uh, whether you can recall the conversation was on that day? I, I personally have some question about that. I'm prepared to accept, but I, I personally actually have some doubt about that, the right. date of that conversation. Yeah. Well, the reason why I was asking you that, if we look at tab 13, this is the email from Juanita Foote to ALD. You'll see it was sent on the 12th of October 2011 in the afternoon at 3.43pm. Yeah. All right. Uh, but anyway, you have doubts about whether... You spoke to uh, Stephen Watson on the 12th of October 2011. I spoke to somebody from ACS uh, Insurance. Yes. I do have doubts as to whether on that day that was... Um, and the reason, the reason I have doubts about that date is because, um, number one, my discussion with the, my recollection is on the 12th of October, um, and in fact... There may be evidence of this in my file notes where I made comment that I had spoken to somebody at ACS. Um, I, I yes, think it may have been female. Um, the other reason I have question about the date of that on the, he on the heading of that email is because when I did speak with S Stephen Watson, he indicated to me because... Uh, mediation was underway, as I understood. He indicated to me that he would talk to the insurers because, obviously, 
nobody wanted to mess up mediation that was already happening. All right. Anyway, but you seem to think that your conversation with Stephen Watson might have been on a different day. Yes. All right. Yes, nothing further. <clears throat> Mr Beckett. Yes, no, nothing in my so much. Right. Just, a, just a couple of matters to come back to this issue, um, Pastor, about the credentialing of members and the um, disaffiliation of churches, um, powers held by the... Um, ACC. Um, <coughs> putting to one side the question of when um, the information with respect to the conviction of Jonathan Baldwin officially reached the ACC, there's no question that it did. Um, and I would understand from you that there was no um, issue taken with the accuracy of the finding of the court. No, not at all. And so that must have sent um, considerable shockwaves through uh, the, the ACC, that a church affiliated with the ACC had such a catastrophic thing happen. Certainly, uh, at an executive level, anything... Um of this nature uh, yeah, is regarded as horrendous and, yeah. So it, it happened um, inside a church affiliated with the movement. Yes. But not only that, it happened... Um, it, the um, criminal conduct uh, was the criminal conduct of a credentialed pastor within the church. Yes. So... You've given evidence about, um, in general terms, about the constant review of processes, procedures and policies. And in that context, you've, uh, I, I assume uh, that that constant review process is also uh, takes into account whether or not the credentialing process itself is um, uh, an appropriate... is, is one that is satisfied is uh, sufficiently um, thorough. Yes, I mean, I mean, it, that is a uh, responsibility of the national. The credentialing is specifically the responsibility of the national executive. Um, I, I can't fully answer that, but I, I am aware that, that that is and has been under review and is uh, regularly looked at and reviewed, yes. Right. And, and similarly... Uh, when news of this catastrophe hit the the um, ACC, that uh, it uh, did it cause the ACC to uh, consider um, an in-depth review of those matters that are within um, the remit of the ACC, in other words, the credentialing process itself and the ongoing affiliation of the church? Uh, Your Honour, I, I am aware, I, I'm, I do not sit on executive these days, um, uh, I am aware that the national executive of our movement in this country uh, certainly uh, has uh, looked at and, review and reviewed and is reviewing necessary policies uh, and procedures, I'm probably not in a position to really be able to comment on the details of those that review. Right. Yeah. Are you able to say as to whether or not uh, there was any specific review conducted in the wake of um, the conviction of Jonathan Baldwin of the credentialing process and the, um, and the ongoing affiliation of the church, particularly with respect to its child protection policies, its monitoring and supervision, its complaint handling procedures? I can't say, and again, by this time I was not sitting on executive as, as a member. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I do know that the recommendation, sorry, the recommendation that I made with regard to 
ensuring these matters are followed through appropriately um, was certainly taken on board. Uh, I do know that there is a constant review of child protection policies and, and other policies. I, I, I understand that, yes. but this, this particular circumstance uh, would, would have, perhaps should have, provided uh, the ACC with um, at least an opportunity to examine what happened here inside the institution with respect to the powers that the ACC holds uh, in terms of how these circumstances uh, occurred? Uh, I, I really can't comment because of my role, uh, Your Honour. Um, I really can't answer that properly. I'm sorry. Yeah. To the best of your knowledge in your role, though, you're not aware that that happened? I'm not aware that a review regarding that particular church, I'm sorry, is that what you're asking? Yes. Regarding that particular church, I'm not aware that there has been a specific review of that particular church. Certainly there's been a look at policies and procedures that would affect, obviously, that or other churches in the future. In the sense that this a particular case study, an examination of what happened here, would be an educational opportunity for the ACC itself? Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. But you're not aware that that happened? I'm not aware, but I couldn't say that, that it has not either. I'm sorry. Yes. Anything arising out of that? No, yes. nothing arising. No. Uh, yes. Mr Chowdhury. Sorry. Uh, in what are the requirements uh, in Queensland, to your knowledge, uh, for credential pastors in respect of child protection matters? I've asked, put it poorly, but was there a process where <coughs> checks would be made about credentialed, people seeking credentials in Queensland? Um, in terms of, uh, firstly, obviously for anybody to have, or to apply for a credential, they must have a blue card. Um, and then in 2005, um, if I'm not answering the question yeah, no, correctly, that's fine. Yeah. 2005, we did employ uh, somebody to help address these issues um, of compliance and governance in local churches. So they were engaged uh, and conducted com church compliance seminars throughout our state. Uh, uh, so I know, I know, in 2005 to 2006. Um, some 26 of these seminars were advertised and conducted throughout the state, two of them on the Sunshine Coast. Um, in the state at the time, if my memory serves me correctly, 130-something churches participated, took up that opportunity with more than 250 attendees. Yes. Can I just show you this document, Your Honour? This has the Commission has a copy of this, but it's yet to come uh, through to the other parties. I'll show you, Council Assistant. Yes. If the witness could be shown this, please. Oh, I've got... I'll have a document put up on Elmo. Thank you. And... Uh, and hand up two copies for the bench. <coughs> and I'll tender it after the witness has given Thank his you. evidence. Yes, Mr Chair. Thank you. Uh, just let me know if you need time to look at it, but are you familiar with this document? I, I am familiar with this, yes. If we scroll down to the bottom of the page, if we can, or push down to the bottom of the page. Uh, in fact, I think you signed that at the end. Well, yes. it's under your name, at least. Yes, I did. All right. This was the uh, a statewide uh, memo that was issued to all affiliated pastors and churches about 
the training in child protection courses. Correct, correct. yes. Right. Thank you. And you mentioned before about a requirement for credential pastors in Queensland to hold a blue card. Yes. Uh, I'm sure there are similar cards in other states. Can you just briefly explain what the blue card is? The blue card, um, you correct, various states have different requirements. Queensland has a blue card system which uh, conducts uh, a police check uh, against that person and establishes their suitability to, uh, to work with children and young people. And if this document could be shown, uh, please. Again, the Commission has this. If it could be put up on the uh, overhead projector. Just so we don't get confused, I'll tender that first document. Uh, it's entitled New State Initiative Through Church Life Queensland. Exhibit 18.0035. They'll hand up some copies of this document entitled Connection, Queensland Assemblies of God. So there's two copies for the bench and one copy for Elmo. And um, I'll tender that now. Eighteen point zero zero three six. Thanks. Uh, this is a photocopy, sir. Uh, do you know what connection was at that time? Yeah, Connection was the uh, state publication newsletter that went to uh, our uh, all credential passes. Yes, How, the state. Sorry. How was it distributed? Uh, what year was this? Uh, this is in uh, 2006, May 2006. 2006, um, if my memory serves me correctly, was probably still a hard copy. Yes. Is that through the mail? Yes. All right. Do you know how it's distributed now? Uh, by email. Yes. If we go to the second page, please. Uh, this was a uh, form advising pastors of the legal requirement for all credential holders to have a blue card, correct? Correct, yes. Thank you. And if we go to the third page. And this is the newsletter that has various articles in it, correct? That's right, yes. If we just go to the bottom of that page under church reviews. And is that uh, a segment about yes. Neil and Sabrina Scott conducting seminars about complying with Commonwealth and State Government legislation? That's correct, yes. Thank yes. you. Yes, the questions I have on that document. Uh, I think Councillor Assisting was going to tender that? It's tendered. Oh, it has been tendered. Has there been we go. Tendered. Thank you. Uh, one other question. In the light of the conviction of a youth pastor for very serious criminal offences, uh, I want to ask you questions about whether a review should be conducted and you weren't aware of one. Do you consider that? the policies or procedures should have been reviewed as a result of that knowledge? Yes, uh, <clears throat> because I would, I would say that, you know, as an organisation's organisation, uh, we regularly, constantly review policies and procedures, yes. Yes, I'm not a Thank you. There's a couple of things arising from that. Yes. Um, I'll just be as brief as I can. Yes. Uh, I wonder if Exhibit 1835 could come up, please. These are the two documents that Mrs Chowdhury took you to a moment ago. The first one, the, the New State Initiative through Church Life Queensland. Am I correct in saying that this is uh, a document that I've made my way through it? It's a reference to something called AOG Assist, which will become a storehouse of information for our churches, Queensland and Australia-wide. Is that right? That's correct, yes. And that's the subject of this particular memo, is it? Well, it's part... Part of the subject, yes. 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 And um, 
the information says the information will be available to our churches will cover a number of pastoral and administrative areas. Yes. And that includes work contracts, children's ministry, and how to ensure that's a safe environment for children. Yes. Fringe benefit system, constitution, and a whole lot of other matters. Yes. All right. And was this what was the purpose of this document? Was it sent out to um, each this, of the affiliated churches? Uh, yes, it was. Yes. Yes. Right. It would have been sent to all, uh, not just churches, but to all credential holders. Yes. So it's an indication that there's some form of information that's available if you, I presume, make contact with the the ACC at the state level, is that right? Yes, and national, that was actually a national uh, online site, uh, which today the equivalent is, I think, for memory, is called Access, but, but yes, similar uh, information is available. All right, and then uh, if we go to 1836, <coughs> particularly the third page there, Process of, of review of churches, is that right? If we go to the bottom of that page. So it'll come up. There we are. Yes. Um, and that was a process involving feedback from seminars? Uh, no, this was um, church reviews was a program that was conducted whereby uh, churches were invited to attend, uh, everything provided for them. Uh, it was an audit checklist of everything that they needed to have in place uh, on every level of governance and compliance, yes. All right, so, uh, but effectively it says here, the, the feedback from the seminars has indicated that a number of our churches are not current with government legislation. You yeah. see that? Yes, sir. Yeah. And suggesting that child protection policy is one of the areas that are lacking and that work needs to be done on that. Yeah. All right. Uh, Doesn't seem to indicate where what steps need to be taken by the churches to ensure that adequate child protection policy is uh, put in place. But well, <clears throat> uh, if I can comment on that, I mean, that was simply the fact that as that became worse, we began to conduct these reviews, and obviously there were many churches that were compliant or up to date. There were some that weren't, um, and that was in fact one of the reasons why we had engaged a particular staff. Uh, member Neil Scott, his name is there, uh, to assist churches with that, and he travelled all over uh, this state assisting churches uh, to do that. Yeah. To ensure compliance, including in child protection? Yes. Was he a specialist in child protection matters? He wasn't, but uh, personally, but uh, all information that had been uh, put together from uh, professional and, and appropriate sources. Do you know if he went to um, the Sunshine Coast Church, the subject of this part of the case study? He didn't go, to my knowledge, he didn't go to that church specifically, but during the financial year, but certainly 05, 06 year, uh, July to June, there were two of these seminars that were conducted in that region. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. That's my question. Thank you, um, thank you, Pastor Spencer, and you're excused. Thank you, Your Honour. Your Honour, I noticed the time. Uh, we have two witnesses <coughs> left uh, for this case study, uh, um, Pastor Hunt, who's the State President of the ACC, and then Pastor Alcorn, who's the National President for tomorrow. Um, and um, if, if Your Honour pleases, we'll, we can commence that first thing tomorrow morning. Yes. I'm, I'm not sure whether or not you're suggesting we start uh, earlier than 10, Mr Becker? I'm in Your Honour's hands. If, uh, if you wish to start earlier, then um, I'm sure we can, we can accommodate that. Just if there is a concern, of course, that um, yes. concern that we won't finish with those two witnesses in the, in the space of the Yes, day. well, I think, I think certainly I'm happy to take that on board. And as long as other council and solicitors at the bar table are... Um, yeah, I'm uh, certainly happy to start as early as whatever the uh, Commission wants to do. Do you want to say anything, Mr Kernigan, yeah. about, a, about no. a 9 a 9.30 start? No? I can indicate, Your Honour, that I won't be here tomorrow and uh, so there'll that, be no one on behalf of Mr Peters. All right, so that doesn't trouble you, doesn't trouble. Mr Taylor? Thank you. So perhaps in those circumstances, just to be um, absolutely sure, we'll 
we will commence then at 9.30 tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.